set of horses' hoofs behind them, like a slightly delayed echo. Then the other horse changed gait as well to match their own, and the sound was gone. Range our horse, Holt said softly. It'll be Gillen, for sure. How can you tell? Will asked. Only a ranger horse could change his pace as quickly as that. And it'll be Gillen, because it's always Gillen. He loves trying to catch me out. Why? asked Will. And Holt looked sternly at him. Because he was my last apprentice, he explained. And for some reason, former apprentices just love to catch their former masters with their breeches down. He looked accusingly at his current apprentice. Will was about to protest that he would never behave in such a fashion after he graduated, then realized that he probably would, and at the very first opportunity. The protest died unspoken. Holt signaled for silence and scanned the trail ahead of them. Then he pointed. That's the spot they are, he said. Ready? There was a large tree close to the side of the trail, with branches hanging out just above head height. Will studied it for a moment, then nodded. Tug and Abelard continued their even pacing toward the tree. As they came closer, Will kicked his feet from the stirrups and rose to stand, crouching on Tug's back. The horse didn't vary his pace as his master shifted position. As they passed under the branches, Will reached up and seized the lowest one, swinging himself up onto it. The instant his weight left Tug's back, the little horse began to pace more vigorously, forcing his hooves into the ground with each step, so that there would be no sign to a tracker behind them that his load had suddenly lightened. Silently, Will climbed higher into the tree until he found a spot where he had a solid perch and a clear view. He could see Halt and the two horses moving slowly down the trail. As they reached the next bend, Holt urged Tug to keep going, then halted Abelard and swung down from the saddle. He dropped to his knees, seeming to study the ground for signs of tracks. Now Will could hear the other horse behind them. He looked back the way they had come, but another bend hid their follower from sight. Then the soft hoofbeats ceased. Will's mouth was dry, and his heart beat faster and faster inside his ribcage. He was sure the sound must be audible to anyone within fifty meters or so. But his training asserted itself, and he stood motionless on the tree branch, among the leaves and dappled shadows, watching the trail behind them. A movement! He saw it from the corner of his eye, then it was gone. He peered closely at the spot for a second or two, then remembered Hort's lessons. Don't focus your attention on one spot. Keep a wide focus all the time and keep scanning. You'll see him as a movement, not as a figure. Remember, he's a ranger too, and he's been trained in the art of not being seen. Will widened his focus and scanned the forest behind them. Within seconds, he was rewarded by another sign of movement. A branch swung back into place as an unseen figure passed silently by. Then, Ten meters farther on, a bush swayed slightly. Then he saw a clump of tall grass springing slowly back into position from where a passing foot had crushed it momentarily. Will stayed stock still. He marveled at the fact that their pursuer could move through the forest without his seeing him. Obviously, the other ranger had left his horse behind and was stalking Halt on foot. Will's eyes swiveled for a quick glance at Halt. His teacher still seemed to be preoccupied with some sign on the ground. Another movement came from the forest. The unseen ranger had passed Will's hiding place now, and was moving back toward the trail, intent on surprising Hort from behind. Suddenly, a tall figure in a grey-green cloak seemed to rise out of the ground in the middle of the trail, some twenty meters behind the kneeling figure of Hort. Will blinked. One moment the figure hadn't been there. Next, he seemed to materialize out of thin air. Will's hand began to move toward the quiver of arrows slung over his back. Then he halted the movement. 
Holt had told him the night before, Wait until we're talking. If he's not talking, he'll hear the slightest movement you make. Will gulped, hoping that the tall figure hadn't heard the movement of his hand toward the quiver. But it seemed that he'd stopped in time. Below him, he heard a cheerful voice call out, Halt! Halt! Holt turned and rose slowly to his feet, brushing the dirt from his knees as he rose. He put his head on one side and studied the figure in the middle of the trail, who was leaning easily on a longbow identical to Holt's own. Well, Gillen, he called, I see you're still making that old joke. The tall ranger shrugged and replied cheerfully, The joke appears to be on you this year, Holt. As Gillen spoke, Will's hand moved quickly but quietly to his quiver and selected an arrow, laying it ready on the bowstring. Holt was speaking again now. Really, Gillen? And what joke would that be, I wonder? The amusement was evident in Gillen's voice as he replied to his old master. Come now, Holt. Admit it. For once I've got the best of you, and you know how many years I've been trying. Holt rubbed one hand over his grizzled beard thoughtfully. It beats me why you keep on trying, Gillen, as a matter of fact. Gillen laughed. You should know how much pleasure it gives an ex-apprentice to get the better of his master, Holt. Now come on, admit it. This year, I've won. As the tall figure spoke, Will carefully drew back the arrow, sighting on a tree trunk some two metres to Gillen's left. Holt's instructions echoed in his ears. Choose a target close enough to startle him when you shoot, but for pity's sake not too close. If he moves, I don't want you putting an arrow through him. Holt hadn't moved from his position in the centre of the trail. Gillen was now shifting his weight uneasily from one foot to another. Holt's unperturbed manner was beginning to bother him. It appeared that, all of a sudden, he wasn't totally sure that Holt was merely trying to bluff his way out of the trap. Holt's next words added to his suspicions. Ah, yes, apprentices and masters. They're a strange combination, all right. But tell me, Gillen, my old apprentice, aren't you forgetting something this year? Perhaps it was the way Holt laid a little extra stress on the word apprentice, but suddenly Gillen became aware that he had made a mistake. His head began to turn, searching for the apprentice that he'd forgotten. As he began the movement, Will released his arrow. The shaft hissed through the air past the tall ranger and thudded, quivering into the tree that Will had selected. Gillen jerked back with shock. Then his eyes swung into the branches of the tree where Will stood concealed. Will marvelled that even caught by surprise as he was, Gillen was still able to react so quickly in identifying the direction from which his attacker had shot. Gillen shook his head ruefully. His keen eyes could make out the small, grey and green clad figure concealed in the shadows of the tree's foliage. Come down, Will, Holt called, and meet Gillen, one of our more careless rangers. He shook his head at Gillen. I told you when you were a boy, didn't I? Never be too hasty. Don't rush into things. Gillen nodded, somewhat crestfallen. He looked even more so when Will dropped to the ground from the lowest branch, and the tall ranger saw how small and young the apprentice was. It appears, he said, that I was so intent on catching myself an old great fox that I overlooked the small monkey hiding in the trees. He grinned at his own mistake. Monkey, is it? Holt said gruffly. I'd say he's made a monkey out of you today. Will, this is Gillen, my former apprentice and now ranger of Merrick Fife. Although what they did to deserve him is beyond me. Gillen's grin widened and he held out his hand to Will. And just as I was thinking I'd finally got the better of you, Holt, he said cheerfully. So you're Will, he continued, shaking hands firmly. I'm pleased to meet you. That was a neat piece of work, young fellow. Will grinned at Holt, and the older ranger made a slight, meaningful movement of his head. Will remembered the final instructions that Holt had given him the night before. Once you're best a man, never gloat. Be generous, and find something in his actions to praise. 
He won't enjoy being bested, but he'll make a good face of it. Show him you appreciate it. Praise can win you a friend. Gloating will only ever make enemies. Yes, I'm Will, he said. Then he added, Could you perhaps teach me how you move like that? It was brilliant. Gillen laughed ruefully. Not too brilliant, I think. You obviously saw me coming from a long way away. Will shook his head, remembering how hard he'd tried to spot Gillen. Now that he thought of it, his praise and his request were more genuine than he'd realised. I saw you when you arrived, he said, and I saw where you'd been, but I never once saw you from the time you rounded that bend. I wish I could move like that. Gillen's face showed his pleasure at Will's obvious sincerity. Well, Holt, he said, I see this young fellow doesn't merely have talent. He has excellent manners as well. Holt regarded the two of them, his current apprentice and his former student. He nodded to Will, approving his tactful words. Unseen movement was always Gillen's best skill, he said. You'd do well if he agreed to tutor you. He moved toward his ex apprentice and placed his arm around the taller man's shoulders. It's good to see you again. They embraced each other warmly. Then Holt held the other man at arm's length, studying him carefully. You get lankier every year, he said finally. When are you going to put some meat on those bones? Gillen smiled. It was obviously an old joke between them. You appear to have enough for both of us, he said. He poked Holt in the ribs, none too gently. Is that the beginnings of a pot belly I see there? He grinned at Will. I'll wager he's sitting around the cabin letting you do all the housework these days. Before Holt or Will could reply, he turned away and let out a whistle. A few seconds later, his horse trotted around the bend in the road. As the tall young ranger moved toward his horse and mounted, Will noticed a sword hanging in a scabbard from the saddle. He turned to Holt, puzzled. I thought we weren't allowed to have swords, he said quietly. Holt frowned for a moment, not understanding, then followed Will's gaze and realised what had prompted the question. It's not that we're not allowed, he explained, as they both mounted. It's a matter of priorities. It takes years to become a good swordsman, and we don't have the time. We have other skills to develop. He saw the next question forming on Will's lips and went on. Gillen's father is a knight, so Gillen had already been training with the sword for some years before he joined the Rangers. He was considered a special case, and he was allowed to continue that training when he was apprenticed to me. But I thought. Will began and then hesitated. Gillen was trotting his horse toward them, and he wasn't sure if it would be polite to ask his next question in front of him. Never say that in front of Holt, Gillen said. Overhearing Will's last words, he'll simply reply, You're an apprentice. You're not ready to think. Or, if you'd thought about it, you wouldn't ask. Will had to smile. Holt had used those exact words to him on more than one occasion, and Gillen's impersonation of the older ranger was uncanny. Now, however, both men were looking expectantly at him, waiting to hear the question he had been about to ask, so he plunged ahead. If Gillen's father was a knight, wasn't he automatically eligible for battle school? Or did they think he was too small as well? Holt and Gillen exchanged a look. Holt raised one eyebrow, then gestured for Gillen to reply. I could have gone to battle school, he said, but I chose to join the Rangers. Some of us do, you know, Holt put in mildly. Will thought this over. He had always assumed that the Rangers did not come from the ranks of the kingdom's nobles. Apparently he was wrong. But I thought. He began and instantly realised his mistake. Holt and Gillen looked at him, then looked at each other, and said in chorus, You are an apprentice. You're not ready to think. Then they wheeled their horses and trotted off. Will hurriedly retrieved Tug and cantered after them. As he caught up, the two rangers edged their horses to either side, allowing him space to ride between them. 
Gillen grinned once at him. Hort was as grim as ever. But as they continued in a companionable silence, Will became aware of the comforting realization that he was now a part of an exclusive, tightly knit group. It was a warm sense of belonging, as if, somehow, he had arrived home for the first time in his life. Chapter 24 Something's happened, Holt said quietly, signalling for his two companions to rein in their horses. The three riders had cantered the last half a kilometre to the gathering ground. Now, as they crested a slight rise, the open space among the trees lay just below them, a hundred metres away. Small, one-man tents stretched in ordered ranks, and the smoke of cooking fires centred the air. An archery range had been set up to one side of the open space, and several dozen horses, all small and shaggy ranger horses, were grazing close to the trees. Even from where they sat in their horses, they could make out an air of urgency and activity throughout the camp. In the centre of the tent lines was a larger pavilion, easily four metres by four metres, and with enough headroom for a tall man to stand. The sides were currently rolled up, and Will could see a group of green and grey-clad men standing around a table, apparently deep in conversation. As they watched, one of the group detached himself, running to a horse waiting just outside the entrance. He mounted and spun the horse on its back legs, setting out through the camp at a gallop, heading for the narrow track through the trees at the far side. He had barely disappeared into the deep shadows under the trees when another rider appeared from the opposite direction, galloping through the lines and reining in outside the large tent. His horse had barely stopped before he swung down and headed in to join the group inside. "'What is it?' Will asked. Frowning, he realised that several of the small tents were being struck and rolled up by their owners. "'Not sure,' Holt replied. He gestured to the tent lines. "'See if you can find us a decent campsite. I'll see what's going on.' He urged Abelard forward then turned and called back. Don't pitch the tents yet. From the looks of things, we may not be needing them. Then Abelard's hooves were drumming on the turf as he galloped toward the centre of the camp. Will and Gillen found a campsite under a large tree, reasonably close to the central gathering area. Then, uncertain as to what they should do next, they sat on a log, waiting for Holt's return. As a senior ranger in the corps, Holt had access to the larger pavilion, which Gillen explained was the command tent. The corps commandant, a ranger named Crowley, would meet with his staff there each day to organise activities and to collate and evaluate the reports and information that individual rangers brought to the gathering. Most of the tents near the two younger rangers were unoccupied, but there was a thin, gangly ranger outside one, pacing impatiently back and forth, looking every bit as confused as Gillen and Will. Seeing them on the log, he moved over to join them. "'Any news?' he said immediately, and his face fell when Gillen answered. "'We were just about to ask you the same question.' He held out his hand in greeting. "'It's Merrin, isn't it?' he said, and they shook hands. "'That's right. And you're Gillen, if I remember correctly.' Gillen introduced Will, and the newcomer, who appeared to be in his early thirties, "'looked at him speculatively. "'So you're Holt's new apprentice,' he said. "'We wondered what you'd be like. "'I was going to be one of your assessors, you know.' "'Going to be?' Gillen asked quickly, "'and Merrin looked at him. "'Yes. I doubt we'll continue with the gathering now.' "'He hesitated, then added, "'You mean you haven't heard?' "'The two newcomers shook their heads. "'More Gareth is up to something again,' he said quietly and Will felt a shiver of fear up his spine at the mention of that evil name. "'What's happened?' Gillen asked, his eyes narrowing. Merrin shook his head, stirring the dirt in front of him with the toe of his boot in a frustrated gesture. "'There's no clear news so far, only garbled reports. But it looks as if a force of war gulls broke out of Three-Step Pass some days ago. They overran the sentries there and headed north. "'Was Morganeth with them?' Gillen asked. Will remained wide-eyed and silent. He couldn't bring himself to ask any questions, couldn't bring himself to actually mention Morgarrett's name. 
Merrin shrugged in reply. We don't know. Don't think so at this stage, but Crowley has been sending scouts out for the past two days. Could be it's just a raid, but if it's more than that, it could mean the start of another war. If so, it's a bad time to lose Lord Loriac. Gillen looked up, concern in his voice. Loriac is dead, he asked, and Merrin nodded. Stroke, apparently, or his heart. He was found dead a few days ago, with not a mark on him, staring straight ahead, stone cold dead. But he was in his prime, Gillen said. I saw him only a month ago, and he was as healthy as a bull. Merrin shrugged. He had no explanation. He only knew the facts of the matter. I suppose it can happen to anyone, he said. You just never know. Who's Lord Loriac? Will asked Gillen quietly. The young ranger shook his head thoughtfully as he answered. Loriac of Steden. He was the leader of the king's heavy cavalry. Probably our best cavalry commander. As Merrin said, if there's war, he'll be sorely missed. A cold hand of fear closed around Will's heart. All his life, people had spoken in whispers of Morgareth, if they had spoken of him at all. The great enemy had assumed the proportions almost of a myth, a legend from the old dark days. Now the myth was becoming reality once more, a confronting, terrifying reality. He looked at Gillen for reassurance, but the young ranger's handsome face showed nothing but doubt and concern for the future. It was almost an hour before Halt rejoined them. As it was after midday, Will and Gillen had prepared a meal of bread, cold meat, and dried fruit. The grey-haired ranger slid down from Mabillard's saddle and accepted a plate from Will, eating the food in quick bites. The gathering's over, he said shortly, between mouthfuls. Seeing the senior ranger's arrival, Merrin had drifted back to join their group. He and Halt greeted each other briefly. Then Merrin posed the question that was on all their minds. "'Is it war?' he asked anxiously, and Holt shook his head. "'We don't know for certain. Latest reports show that Morgareth is still in the mountains.' "'Then why did the war goals break out?' Will asked. Everyone knew that war goals only did the will of Morgareth. They never would have performed such a radical act without his direction. Holt's face was grim as he answered. They're only a small party, perhaps fifty of them. They were intended to act as a diversion. While our guards were busy chasing the war gulls, Crowley thinks that the two Calcara slipped out of the mountains and are hauled up somewhere on the solitary plain. Gillen gave a low whistle. Merrin actually took a step back in surprise. Both the younger rangers' faces showed their utter horror at the news. Will had no idea what the Calcara might be, but judging from Hall's expression and the reactions of Gillen and Merrin, they were obviously not good news. "'You mean they still exist?' Merrin said. "'I thought they died out years ago.' "'Oh, they still exist, all right,' Holt said. "'There are only two of them left, but that's enough to worry about.' There was a long silence between them. Finally, hesitantly, Will had to ask, "'What are they?' Holt shook his head sadly. It was not a subject that he wanted to discuss with someone as young as Will. But, knowing what lay ahead of them all, he had no choice. The boy had to know. When Morgareth was planning his rebellion, he wanted more than an ordinary army. He knew that if he could terrify his enemies, his task would be far easier. So over the years, he made several expeditions into the mountains of rain and night, searching. Searching for what? Will asked, although he had the uncomfortable feeling that he knew what the answer would be. For allies he could use against the kingdom. The mountains are an ancient, undisturbed part of the world. They've remained unchanged for centuries, and there were rumours that strange beasts and ancient monsters still lived there. The rumours turned out to be all too true. Like the war gulls, Will put in, and Holt nodded. Yes, like the war gulls. "'and he very quickly enslaved them and bent them to his will,' "'he said with a touch of bitterness in his voice. "'But then he found the Calcara, "'and they are worse than war gulls. "'Much, much worse.' "'Will said nothing. "'The thought of beasts that were worse than war gulls "'was a disturbing one, to say the least. 
There were three of them. But one was killed about eight years ago, so we know a little more about them. Think of a creature somewhere between an ape and a bear that walks upright, and you'll have an idea of what a Kalkara looks like. So, does Morgareth control them with his mind, like the Wargals? Will asked. Holt shook his head. No, they're more intelligent than Wargals, but they are totally obsessed with silver. They worship it and hoard it, and Morgareth apparently gives it to them in large amounts so they'll do his bidding, and they do it well. They can be incredibly cunning while they stalk their prey. Prey? Will asked. What sort of prey? Holt and Gillen exchanged a glance, and Will could see that his mentor was reluctant to talk about the subject. For a moment, he thought Holt was going to begin another of his dissertations on Will's endless questions. But then he realised this was a far more serious matter than idle curiosity, as the grizzled ranger replied quietly, The Kalkara are assassins. Once they've been given a specific victim, they will do anything in their power to reach that person and kill them. Can't we stop them? Will asked, his gaze shifting briefly to Holt's massive longbow and the bristling quiver of black arrows. They're very difficult to kill, they have a thick hair covering that's matted and bonded together, so that it's almost like scales. An arrow will hardly penetrate. A battle-axe or a broadsword is best against them, or a good thrust with a heavy spear might do the job. Will felt a moment of relief. These Kalkara had started to sound almost invincible, but there were plenty of accomplished knights in the kingdom who would doubtless be able to account for them. So was it a knight who killed the one eight years ago? he asked. Holt shook his head. Not a knight. Three. It took three fully armed knights to kill it, and only one of them survived the battle. What's more, he was crippled for life, Holt finished grimly. Three men, all of them knights, Will said incredulously. But how? Gillen interrupted him before he could finish. Problem is, if you get close enough to use a sword or spear, the Kalkara can usually stop you before you have a chance. As he spoke, his fingers drummed lightly on the hilt of the sword that he wore at his waist. How does it stop you? Will asked, the momentary feeling of relief instantly dispelled by Gillen's words. This time it was Merrin who answered. Its eyes, the gangly ranger said. If you look into its eyes, you are frozen helpless the way a snake freezes a bird with its gaze before it kills it. Will looked from one to the other of the three men, uncomprehending. What Merrin was saying seemed too far-fetched to be true, yet Holt wasn't contradicting him. Freezes you? How can it do that? Are you talking about magic here? Holt shrugged. Merrin looked away uncomfortably. None of them liked discussing this subject. Some people call it magic, Holt finally said. I think it's more like a form of hypnotism. Either way, Merrin is right. If a Kalkara can make you look into its eyes, you become paralysed by sheer terror, unable to do anything to save yourself. Will glanced around anxiously, as if expecting any moment to see an ape-bear creature charging out of the silent trees. He could feel panic growing in his chest. Somehow, he'd come to think of Holt as invincible, yet here he was, seeming to admit that there was no defence against these vile monsters. "'Isn't there anything you can do?' he asked in a hopeless voice. Holt shrugged. "'Legend has it that they are particularly vulnerable to fire. Problem is, as before, getting close enough to do any damage. Carrying a naked flame makes it a little difficult to stalk a Kalkara. They tend to hunt at night, and they can see you coming. Will found it difficult to believe what he was hearing. Holt seemed so matter-of-fact about it all, and Gillen and Merrin were obviously disturbed by his news. There was an awkward silence, which Gillen broke by asking, What makes Crowley think that Morgareth is using them? Holt hesitated. He'd been told Crowley's thoughts in private council. Then he shrugged. They'd all need to know about it sooner or later, and they were all members of the Ranger Corps, even Will. 
He's already used them twice in the past year, to kill Lord Northolt and Lord Loriac. The three younger men all exchanged puzzled glances, so he went on. Northolt was thought to be killed by a bear, remember? Will nodded slowly. He remembered now. On his first day as Holt's apprentice, the ranger had received news of the Supreme Commander's death. I thought at the time that Northolt was too skilled a hunter to be killed that way. Crowley evidently agrees. But what about Loriac? Everyone said it was a stroke. It was Merrin who asked this question. Holt glanced at him briefly, then answered. You'd heard that, had you? Well, his physician was most surprised, said he'd never seen a healthier man. On the other hand, he paused, and Gillen finished the thought. It could have been the work of the Calcara. Holt nodded. Exactly. We don't know the full effects of the freezing stare they've developed. Maintained over a long enough time, the terror could well be enough to stop a man's heart, and there were vague reports that a large, dark animal was seen in the area. Again, silence settled over the small group under the trees. Around them, rangers bustled to and fro, striking camp and saddling their horses. Holt finally roused them all from their thoughts. We'd best be moving. Merrin, you'll need to return to your fife. Crowley wants the army alerted and mobilised. Orders will be distributed in a few minutes. Merrin nodded and turned away toward his campsite. He paused and turned back. Something in Holt's voice, the way he had said, you'll need to return to your fife, had made him think. What about you three? he said. Where are you going? Even before Holt answered, Will knew what he was going to say, but that didn't make it any less terrifying or blood-chilling when the words were said. We're going after the Calcara. Chapter 25 The camp buzzed with activity as tents came down and rangers repacked their equipment and tied on their saddlebags. Already, the first few riders had departed, heading back to their own fifes. Will was fastening the ties on their saddle packs, having replaced the few items they had taken out. Holt sat a few metres away, frowning thoughtfully as he studied a map of the area surrounding the solitary plain. The plain itself was a vast, unmapped area, with no roads and few features indicated. A shadow fell across him as he looked up. Gillen stood there, a worried look on his face. Halt, he said in a low, concerned voice. Are you sure about this? Halt met his gaze steadily. Very sure, Gillen. It simply has to be done. But he's only a boy, Gillen protested. "'looking quickly to where Will was tying a pack roll "'back in place behind Tug's saddle. "'Holt let go a long breath, "'his eyes dropping from Gillen's as he spoke. "'I know that, but he's a ranger. "'Apprentice or not, he's a member of the Corps, like all of us.' "'He saw that Gillen was about to protest further, "'out of concern for Will, "'and he felt a surge of affection for his old apprentice. "'Gillen, in an ideal world, "'I wouldn't put him at risk like this.' But this isn't an ideal world. Everyone's going to have to play his part in this campaign, even boys like Will. Morgareth is preparing for something big. Crowley's agents have got wind that, on top of everything else, he's been in touch with the Scandians. The Scandians? What for? Holt shrugged. We don't know the details, but my bet is he's hoping to form an alliance with them. They'll fight anyone for money. And apparently... They'll fight for anyone as well, he added. His distaste for mercenaries obvious in his voice. The point is, we're short-handed enough while Crowley tries to raise the army. Normally, I wouldn't go after the Calcara with a force of less than five senior rangers, but he simply can't spare them for me. So I've had to settle for the two I trust most. You and Will. Gillen grinned crookedly. Well, thanks for that, anyway. He was touched by Holt's confidence. He still looked up to his old mentor. Most of the Ranger Corps did. Besides, I thought that rusty old sword of yours might come in handy if we run into those horrors, Holt said. 
The Ranger Corps had chosen wisely when they allowed Gillen to continue his training with the weapon. Although very few people knew it, Gillen was one of the finest swordsmen in Araluen. As for Will, Holt continued, don't sell him short. He's very resourceful. He's quick and brave, and a damn good shot already. Best of all, he thinks quickly. My real thinking is that if we can get on the trail of the Kalkara, we can send him for reinforcements. That'll help us and keep him out of harm's way. Gillen scratched his chin thoughtfully. Now that Holt had explained it, it seemed the only logical course for them to take. He met the older man's eyes and nodded his understanding of the situation. Then he turned to organise his own kit, only to find that Will had already repacked it and tied it to his saddle. He smiled at Holt. You're right, he said. He does think for himself. The three of them rode out a little while later, while the other rangers were still receiving their orders. Mobilising the Araloon army would be no small task, and it would be the rangers' job to coordinate it, then be ready to guide the individual forces from the fifty fifes to their assembled point at the plains of Uthal. With both Gillen and Hall to sign to searching for the Kalkara, other rangers had to be tasked with coordinating the forces from their fifes as well. There was little said between the three companions as Holt led the way to the southwest. Even Will's natural curiosity was subdued by the magnitude of the task ahead of them. As they rode in silence, his mind's eye kept conjuring images of savage, bear like creatures with the features of apes. Creatures that might well prove to be invincible, even for someone of Holt's skill. Eventually, however, as monotony set in, the horrific images receded and he began to wonder what plan, if any, Holt had in mind. Holt, he said a little breathlessly, where do you hope to find the Kalkara? Holt looked at the serious young face beside him. They were travelling at the ranger's forced march pace, forty minutes in the saddle, riding at a steady canter, then twenty minutes on foot, leading the horses and allowing them to travel unburdened, while the men ran at a steady trot. Every four hours, they would pause for one hour's rest, when they ate a quick meal of dried meat, hard bread and fruit, then rolled into their cloaks to sleep. They had been leading the horses for some time now, and Holt judged that it was time to rest. He led Abelard off the road, and into the shelter of a grove of trees. Will and Gillen followed, dropping the reins and allowing their horses to graze. The best way I can think of, Holt said, in answer to Will's question, is to start at their lair and see if they're in the vicinity. Do we know where that is? Gillen asked. Best intelligence we have is that it's somewhere on the solitary plain, beyond the stone flutes. We'll scout around that area and see what we can find. If they're in the area, we should find that the odd sheep or goat is going missing from villages nearby. Although getting the villagers themselves to talk will be another matter. Plains people are a close-mouthed bunch at the best of times. What's this plain you're talking about? Will asked, through a mouthful of hard bread. And what on earth is a stone flute? The solitary plain is a vast flat area, very few trees, mainly covered in rock outcrops and long grass, Holt told him. The wind seems to always be blowing, no matter what time of year you go there. It's a dismal, depressing place, and the stone flutes are the most dismal part of it. But what are... Will began, but Holt had only paused briefly. The stone flutes? Nobody really knows. They're a circle of standing stones built by the ancients, smack in the middle of the windiest part of the plain. Nobody has ever worked out their original purpose, but they're arranged in such a way that the wind is deflected around the circle, and through a series of holes in the stones themselves. They create a constant keening sound, although why anyone thought they sounded like flutes is beyond me. The sound is eerie and discordant, and you can hear it from kilometres away. After a few minutes, it sets your teeth on edge, and it goes on and on for hours. Will was silent. 
The thought of a dismal, windswept plain and stones that emitted a non-stop keening wail seemed to take the last vestige of warmth from the late afternoon sun. He shivered involuntarily. Holt saw the movement and leaned forward to clap him on the shoulder encouragingly. "'Cheer up!' he said. "'Nothing's ever as bad as it sounds. "'Now let's get some rest.' They reached the outskirts of the solitary plain by noon the second day. Halt was right, Will thought. It was a vast, depressing place. The featureless ground stretched out before them for kilometre after kilometre, covered in tall grey grass, made rank and dry by the constant wind. The wind itself also seemed to be a living presence. It rubbed on their nerves, blowing constantly and unvaryingly from the west, bending the tall grass before it as it swept across the flat ground of the solitary plain. "'Now you can see why they call it the solitary plain,' Holt said to the two of them, reining Abelard in so they could come abreast of him. "'When you ride out into this damned wind, you feel as if you're the only person left alive on earth.' It was true, Will thought. He felt small and insignificant against the emptiness of the plain. And with the feeling of insignificance came an accompanying feeling of impotence. The wasteland they were riding across seemed to hint at the presence of arcane forces, forces far greater than his own capabilities. Even Gillen, normally cheerful and ebullient, seemed affected by the heavy, depressing atmosphere of the place. Only Halt seemed unchanged, remaining grim and taciturn as ever. Gradually, as they rode, Will became aware of a disquieting sensation. Something was lurking, just outside the range of his conscious perception. Something that made him feel uneasy. He couldn't isolate it, couldn't even tell where it was coming from or what form it took. It was just there, ever-present. He shifted in his saddle, standing in the stirrups to scan the featureless horizon in the hopes that he might see the source of it all. Holt noticed the movement. "'You've noticed them,' he said. "'It's the storms.' And now that Holt said it, Will realised that it had been a sound, so faint and so continuous that he couldn't isolate it as such, that had been creating the sense of unease in his mind, and the tight cramping of fear in the pit of his stomach. Or perhaps it was just that as Holt said it, they came into proper earshot of the stone flutes because now he could isolate it. It was an unmelodic series of musical notes, all being played at once, but creating a harsh, discordant sound that jangled the nerves and unsettled the mind. His left hand crept unobtrusively to the hilt of his sax knife as he rode, and he drew comfort from the solid, dependable touch of the weapon. They rode on through the afternoon, never seeming to advance across the empty, featureless plain. With each pace their horses took, the horizons behind and before them seemed to neither recede nor draw closer. It was as if they were marking time in an empty world. The constant keening sound of the stone flutes was with them all day, growing gradually stronger as they travelled. It was the only sign that they were making progress. The hours passed, and the sound continued, and Will found it no easier to bear. It wore at his nerves, keeping him constantly on edge. As the sun began to sink at the western rim, Halt reined Abelard in. "'We'll rest for the night,' he announced. "'It's almost impossible to maintain a constant course in the dark. Without any significant land features to set a course by, we could easily wind up going around in circles.' Gratefully, the others dismounted. Fit as they were, the hours spent at forced march pace had left them bone-weary. Will began scouting around the few stunted bushes that grew on the plain, searching for firewood. Halt, realising what was in his mind, shook his head. "'No fire,' he said. "'We'd be visible for miles, and we have no idea who might be watching.' Will paused, letting the small bundle he had gathered fall to the ground. "'You mean the Kalkara? he said. Holt shrugged. Them? Our plains people. We can't be sure that some of them aren't in league with the Kalkara. 
After all, living cheek by jowl with creatures like that, you might well end up cooperating with them, just to ensure your own safety. And we don't want them getting word that there are strangers on the plain. Gillen was unsaddling Blaze, his bay horse. He dropped the saddle to the ground and rubbed the horse down with a handful of the ever-present dry grass. You don't think we've been seen already? he asked. Hall considered the question for a few seconds before answering. We might have been. There are just too many unknowns here, like where the Kalkara actually have their lair, whether or not the plains people are their allies, whether or not any of them have seen us and reported our presence. But until I know we have been seen, we'll assume we haven't. So, no fire. Gillen nodded reluctantly. You're right, of course, he said. It's just I'd happily kill someone for a cup of coffee. Light a fire to brew it, Hall told him, and you might end up having to do just that. Chapter 26 It was a cold, cheerless camp. Tired from the hard pace they'd been keeping up, the rangers ate a cold meal, bread, dried fruit and cold meat once more, washed down with cold water from their canteens. Will was beginning to hate the sight of the virtually tasteless hard rations they carried. Then Hawk took the first watch as Will and Gillen rolled themselves into their cloaks and slept. It wasn't the first rough camp that Will had endured since his training period began, but this was the first time there wasn't the slight comfort of a crackling fire, or at least a bed of warm coals to sleep by. He slept fitfully, uncomfortable dreams chasing through his subconscious, dreams of fearful creatures, strange and terrifying things that stayed just outside his consciousness, but close enough to the surface that he felt their presence and was unsettled by them. He was almost glad when Halt shook him gently awake for his watch. The wind was scudding clouds across the moon. The moaning song of the stones was stronger than ever. Will felt a weariness of spirit, and wondered if the stones had been designed to wear people down like this. The long grass around them hissed a counterpoint to the far-off keening. Halt pointed to a spot in the heavens, indicating an angle of elevation for Will to remember. When the moon reaches that angle, he told the apprentice, turn over the watch to Gillen. Will nodded, rousing himself and standing to stretch his stiff muscles. He picked up his bow and quiver and walked to the bush Hort had selected as a vantage point. Rangers on watch never stayed in the open by the campsite, but always moved away ten or twenty metres and found a place of concealment. That way, Strangers coming upon the campsite would be less likely to see them. It was one of the many skills Will had learned in his months of training. He took two arrows from the quiver and held them between the fingers of his bow hand. He would hold them thus for the four hours of his watch. If he needed them, there would be no excessive movement as he took an arrow from his quiver, movement that might alert an attacker. Then he flipped the cowl of his cloak over his head so he would merge with the irregular shape of the bush. His head and eyes scanned from side to side as Halt had taught him, changing focus constantly, from close to the campsite and out to the dim horizon around them. That way, his vision would not become fixated on one distance and one area, and he'd stand a better chance of seeing movement. From time to time, he turned slowly through a complete circle, scanning the entire ground around them, moving slowly to keep his own movement as imperceptible as possible. The keening of the stones and the hissing of wind through the grass formed a constant background. But he began to hear other noises as well, the rustling of small animals in the grass and other, less explicable sounds. With each one, his heart raced a little faster, wondering if this might be the Kalkara creeping in on the sleeping figures of his friends. Once he was convinced that he could hear the breath of a heavy animal. Fear rose up in him, clutching at his throat, until he realised that, with his senses tuned to the utmost degree, he could actually hear his companions breathing quietly in their sleep. He knew 
that from any more than five meters away, he would be virtually invisible to the human eye, thanks to the cloak, the shadows, and the shape of the bush around him. But he wondered if the Kalkara depended on sight alone. Perhaps they had other senses that would tell them that there was an enemy concealed in the bush. Perhaps even now they were moving closer, concealed by the long shifting grass, ready to strike. His nerves, already stretched beyond endurance by the stone flute's dismal song, urged him to spin around and identify the source of each new sound as he heard it. But he knew that to do so would be to reveal himself. He forced himself to move slowly, turning carefully until he faced the direction from which he thought the sound had come, assessing each new risk before discarding it. In the long hours of tense watching, he saw nothing but the racing clouds, the fleeting moon, and the undulating sea of grass that surrounded them. By the time the moon reached the preordained elevation, he was physically and mentally drained. He woke Gillen to take over the watch. Then rolled back into his cloak again. This time there were no dreams. Exhausted, he slept soundly until the grey light of dawn. They saw the stone flutes by mid-morning, a grey and surprisingly small circle of granite monoliths that stood at the top of a rise in the plain. Their elected course took the riders a kilometer or so to one side of the stones, and Will was content to go no closer. The depressing song was now louder than ever, ebbing and flowing on the tide of the wind. Next flute player I meet," said Gillen with grim humour. "I'm going to split his lip for him." They rode on, the kilometers passing beneath their horses' hoofs, hour after hour, one the same as the next, with nothing new to see, and always with the faint howl of the stones at their back, keeping their nerves on edge. The plainsman rose suddenly from the grass, some fifty meters away from them. Small, dressed in grey rags and with long hair hanging unkempt to his shoulders, he glared at them through mad eyes for several seconds. Will's heart had barely recovered from the shock of his sudden appearance when he was off, bent double and running through the grass, seeming to sink into it. Within seconds, he had disappeared, swallowed by the grass. Hort was about to urge Abelard in pursuit, but he stopped. The arrow he had selected instantly and laid on the bowstring remained undrawn. Gillen was also ready to shoot. His reactions every bit as sharp as Hort's. He too held his shot, looking curiously at his senior. Hort shrugged. "May mean nothing," he said, "or maybe he's off to tell the Calcara. But we can hardly kill him on suspicion." Gillen let out a short bark of laughter, more to release the tension he felt as a result of the man's unexpected appearance. "I suppose there's no difference," he said, "whether we find the Kalkara or they find us." Holt's eyes fixed on him for a moment, without any sign of answering humour. "Believe me, Gillen," he said, "there's a big difference." They had abandoned the forced march pace now, and walked their horses slowly through the tall grass. Behind them, the sound of the stones began to fade a little, much to Will's relief. Now he realized the wind was carrying it away from them. Some time passed following the sudden appearance of the plain dweller, with no further sign of life. A question had been nagging at Will all through the afternoon. Halt, he said experimentally, not sure if Halt would order him to silence. The ranger looked at him. Eyebrows raised in a sign that he was prepared to answer questions. So Will continued, "Why do you think Morgareth has enlisted the Kalkara? What does he stand to gain?" Halt realized that Gillen was waiting for his answer as well. He marshaled his thoughts before he replied. He was a little reluctant to verbalize his thoughts, as so much of the answer depended on guesswork and intuition. Who knows why Morgareth ever does anything? He answered slowly. I can't give you a definite answer. All I can tell you is what I assume, and what Crowley thinks as well. He glanced quickly at his two companions. It was obvious from their expectant expressions that they were prepared to accept his assumptions as ironclad fact. 
Sometimes, he thought wryly, a reputation for being right all the time could be a heavy burden. There's a war coming, he went on. That much is already obvious. The war gods are on the move, and we've heard that Morgareth has been in contact with Ranyak. He saw the puzzled expression flit across Will's face. Gillen, he knew, understood who Ranyak was. Ranyak is the Oberjarl, or Supreme Lord, if you like, of the Scandians, the Sea Wolves. He saw the quick flash of comprehension and went on. This is obviously going to be a bigger war than we've fought before, and we're going to need all our resources and our best commanders to lead us. I think that's what Morgareth has in mind. He's seeking to weaken us by having the Kalkara kill our leaders. Northolt, the Supreme Army Commander, and Loriac, our best cavalry commander, have gone already. Certainly there will be other men who will step into those positions, but there will inevitably be some confusion in the changeover period, some loss of cohesion. I think that's what's behind Morgareth's plan. Gillen said thoughtfully, There's another aspect as well. Both those men were instrumental in his defeat last time. He's destroying our command structure and getting revenge at the same time. Holt nodded. That's true, of course. And to a twisted mind like Morgareth's, revenge is a powerful motive. So you think there'll be more killings? Will asked, and Holt met his gaze steadily. I think there'll be more attempts. Morgareth has sent them out twice with targets, and they've succeeded. I don't see any reason why they won't go after others. Morgareth has reason to hate a lot of people in the kingdom. The king himself, perhaps. Or maybe Baron Arald. He caused Morgareth some grief in the last war. And so did you, Will thought, with a sudden flash of fear for his teacher. He was about to voice the thought that Holt might be a target, then realised that Holt was probably well aware of the fact himself. Gillen was asking the older ranger another question. One thing I don't understand. Why do the Kalkara keep returning to their hideout? Why not just move from one victim to the next? I suppose that's one of the few advantages we do have, Holt told them. They're savage and merciless and more intelligent than war gulls, but they're not human. They are totally single-minded. Show them a victim and they'll hunt him down and kill him or die themselves in the attempt. But they can only keep track of one victim at a time. Between killings, they'll return to their lair. Then Morgareth, or one of his underlings, will prime them for their next victim, and they'll head out again. Our best hope is to intercept them on the way if they've been given a new target, or kill them in their lair if they haven't. Will looked for the thousandth time at the featureless grass plain that lay before them. Somewhere out there, the two fearsome creatures were waiting, perhaps with a new victim already in mind. Holt's voice interrupted his train of thought. "'Sun's going down,' he said. "'We may as well camp here.' They swung down stiffly from their saddles, easing the girths to make their horses more comfortable. "'That's one thing about this blasted place,' Gillen said, looking around them. "'One spot is as good as another to camp.' Or as bad. Will woke from a dreamless sleep to the touch of Holt's hand on his shoulder. He tossed back the cloak, glanced at the scudding moon overhead, and frowned. He couldn't have been asleep for more than an hour. He started to say so, but Holt stopped him, placing a finger to his lips for silence. Will looked around, and realised Gillen was already awake, standing above him, his head turned to the northeast back the way they had come, listening. Will came to his feet, moving carefully to avoid making any undue noise. His hands had automatically gone to his weapons, but he relaxed as he realised there was no immediate threat. The other two were listening intently. Then Holt raised a hand and pointed to the north. There it is again, he said softly. Then Will heard it. Above the moaning of the stone flutes and the sound of the wind through the grass, and the blood froze in his veins. It was a high-pitched, bestial howl that ululated and climbed in pitch, an inhuman sound carried to them on the wind from the throat of a monster. Seconds later, another howl answered the first, 
slightly deeper in pitch, it seemed to come from a position a little to the left of the first. Without needing to be told, Will knew what the sounds meant. It's the Calcara, Holt said grimly. They have a new target, and they're hunting. Chapter 27 The three companions spent a sleepless night as the hunting cries of the Calcara dwindled to the north. When they first heard the sounds, Gillen had moved to saddle Blaze, the bay horse snorting nervously at the fearsome howling of the two beasts. Halt, however, gestured for him to stop. "'I'm not going after those things in the dark,' he said briefly. "'We'll wait till first light, then look for their tracks.' The tracks were easy enough to find, as the Kalkara obviously made no attempt to conceal their passing. The long grass had been crushed by the two heavy bodies, leaving a clear trail pointing east-northeast. Halt found the trail left by the first of the two monsters. Then a few minutes later, Gillen found the second, about a quarter kilometre to the left and travelling parallel, close enough to provide support in case of an attack, but distant enough to avoid any trap set for its brother. Halt considered the situation for a few moments, then came to a decision. You stay with the second one, he told Gillen. Will and I will follow this one. I want to make sure they both keep heading in the same direction. I don't want one of them doubling back to come behind us. You think they know we're here? Will asked, working hard to keep his voice sounding steady and disinterested. They could. There's been time for that plainsman we saw to have warned them. Or maybe it's just coincidence and they're heading out on their next mission. He glanced at the trail of crushed grass moving irrevocably in one constant direction. They certainly seem to have a purpose. He turned to Gillen again. In any event, keep your eyes peeled and pay close attention to Blaze. The horses will sense these beasts before we will. We don't want to run into an ambush. Gillen nodded and swung Blaze away to return to the second trail. At a hand signal from Hort, the three rangers began riding forward following the direction the Kalkara had taken. "'I'll watch the trail,' Holt told Will. "'You keep an eye on Gillen, just in case.' Will turned his attention to the tall ranger, some two hundred metres away and keeping pace with them. Blaze was only visible from the shoulders up, his lower half masked by the long grass. From time to time... Undulations in the intervening ground took both rider and horse out of sight, and the first time this happened, Will reacted with a cry of alarm as Gillen simply seemed to disappear into the ground. Halt turned quickly, an arrow already at half draw, but at that moment Gillen and Blaze reappeared, seemingly unconscious of the moment of panic they'd caused. Sorry, Will muttered, annoyed that he'd allowed his nerves to get the better of him. Holt regarded him shrewdly. "'That's all right,' he said steadily. "'I'd rather you let me know any time you even think there's a problem.' Holt knew only too well that having called a false alarm once, Will might be reluctant to react next time, and that could be fatal for all of them. "'Tell me every time you lose sight of Gillen, and tell me again when he reappears,' he said. Will nodded, understanding his teacher's reasoning. And so they rode on, the keening cry of the flute swelling in their ears again as they approached the stone circle. This time they would pass much closer, Will realised, as the Kalkara seemed to be heading straight for the site. As they rode, their passage was marked by intermittent reports from Will. He's gone. Still gone. All right. I see him again. The dips and rises in the ground were virtually invisible under the waving cover of tall grass. In fact, Will was never sure whether it was Gillen passing through a depression or he and Halt. Often it was a combination of both. There was one bad time Gillen and Blaze sank from sight and didn't reappear within the customary few seconds. I can't see him, Will reported. Then, still gone? Still gone? 
no sign of him. His voice began to rise in pitch as the tension grew within him. No sign of them. Still no sign. Halt brought Abelard to a stop, his bow ready once again. His eyes searching the ground to their left as they waited for Gillen to reappear. He let go a piercing whistle, three ascending notes. There was a pause, then an answering whistle. This time, the same three notes in descending order came clearly to them. Will heaved a sigh of relief, and just at that moment, Gillen reappeared, large as life. He faced them and made a large gesture with both arms raised in an obvious question: "What's the problem?" Holt made a negative gesture, and they moved on. As they approached the stone flutes, Holt became more and more watchful. The Kalkara that he and Will were trailing was heading straight toward the circle. He reined in Abelard and shaded his eyes, studying the dismal grey rocks intently, looking for movement or any sign that the Kalkara might be lying in wait to ambush them. It's the only decent cover for miles around. He said, "Let's not take the chance that the damn thing could be lurking in there, waiting for us. We'll go a little carefully, I think." He signalled for Gillen to join them and explain the situation. Then they split up to form a wide perimeter around the stones, riding in slowly from three different directions, checking their horses for any possible sign of reaction as they came closer. But the sight was empty, although close up. The jangling moan of the wind through the flute holes was close to unbearable. Holt chewed his lip reflectively, staring out across the sea of grass at the two undeviating trails left by the Kalkara. This is taking us too long," he said finally. "As long as we can see their trails for a couple of hundred meters ahead, we'll move faster. Slow down when you come to a rise, or any time when the trail isn't visible for more than fifty meters." Gillen nodded his understanding and resumed his wide position. They urged their horses on now in a canter, the easy lope of the ranger horse that would eat the kilometers ahead of them. Will maintained his watch on Gillen, and whenever the visible trail diminished, either Holt or Gillen would whistle, and they would slow to a walk until the ground opened up again before them. As night fell, they camped once again. Holt still refused to follow the two killers in the dark, even though the moon meant their trail was easily visible. Too easy for them to double back in the dark, he said. I want plenty of warning when they finally come at us. You think they will? Asked Will, noticing that Holt had said when, not if. The ranger smiled reassuringly at his young pupil. Always assume an enemy knows you're there and that he will attack you. He said, "That way, you tend to avoid unpleasant surprises." He smiled grimly to reassure the boy. It can still be unpleasant, but at least it's not a surprise. In the morning, they resumed the trail once more, moving at the same brisk pace, slowing only when they had no clear sight of the lie of the land ahead of them. By early afternoon. They had reached the edge of the plain and rode once again into the wooded country to the north of the mountains of Rain and Night. Here they found the two Kalkara had joined company, no longer keeping the wide separation they had maintained on the open ground of the plain, but their chosen path remained the same, east of northeast. The three rangers followed this course for another hour before halt reined in Abelard and signalled the others to dismount for a conference. They grouped around a map of the kingdom that he unrolled out on the grass, using arrows as weights to stop the edges from re-rolling. Judging from their tracks, we've made up some time on them," he said. "But there's still a good half day ahead of us. Now, this is the direction they're following." He took another arrow and laid it on the map, orientating it so that it pointed to the direction the Kalkara had been following for the past two days and nights. As you can see, if they keep going in this direction, there are only two places of any significance that they could be heading for. He pointed to a place on the map. Here, the Gorlan ruins, or farther north, Castle Araluen itself. 
Gillen drew in breath sharply. Castle Araluen, he said. You don't think they dare try for King Duncan? Holt looked at him and shook his head. I simply don't know, he replied. We don't know nearly enough about these beasts, and half of what we think we know is probably myth and legend. But you've got to admit, it would be a bold stroke, a master stroke, and Morgareth has never been averse to that sort of thing. He let the others digest the thought for a few moments, then traced a line from their current position to the northwest. Now, I've been thinking. Look, here's Castle Redmond, perhaps a day's ride away, and then another day to here. From Redmond, he traced a line northeast to the Golan ruins marked on the map. One person, riding hard and using two horses, could make it in less than a day to Redmond and then lead the Baron and Sir Rodney here, to the ruins. If the Kalkara keep moving at the pace they are, we might just be able to intercept them there. It'll be close, but it's possible. And with two warriors like Arald and Rodney on hand, we'll stand a far better chance of stopping the damn things once and for all. One moment, Holt, Gillen interrupted. You said one person, riding two horses... Holt met Gillen's gaze with his own. He could see that the young ranger had already divined what he had in mind. That's right, Gillen, he said, and the lightest one among us will travel fastest. I want you to turn Blaze over to Will. If he alternates between Tog and your horse, he can do it in the time. He saw the reluctance on Gillen's face and understood it perfectly. No ranger would like the idea of handing his horse over to someone else even another ranger. But at the same time Gillen understood the logic behind the suggestion. Holt waited for the younger man to break the silence, while Will watched the two of them, eyes wide with alarm at the thought of the responsibility that was about to be loaded onto him. Finally, reluctantly, Gillen broke the silence. I suppose it makes sense, he said. So what do you want me to do? Follow behind me on foot. Holt said briskly, rolling the chart up and replacing it in his saddlebag. If you can get hold of a horse anywhere, do so and catch up with me. Otherwise, we'll rendezvous at Gorlan. If we miss the Kalkara there, Will can wait for you, with Blaze. I'll keep following the Kalkara until you all catch up with me. Gillen nodded his acquiescence, and Holt felt a surge of fondness for him as he did. Once Gillen saw the sense of his proposal, he wasn't the kind to raise arguments or objections. He did say, rather ruefully, "'I thought you said my sword might come in handy.' "'I did,' replied Holt. "'But this gives me a chance to bring in two fully armoured knights, with axes and lances. And you know that's the best way to fight the Kalkara. "'True,' said Gillen. Then, taking Blaze's bridle, he knotted the reins together and threw them over the bay's neck. "'You may as well start out on Tug,' he said to Will. "'That'll give Blaze a chance to rest. "'He'll follow behind you without the lead rein, "'and so will Tug when you're riding Blaze. "'Tie the reins up like this on Tug's neck "'so they don't dangle down and snag anything.' "'He began to turn back to Holt, then remembered something. "'Oh, yes, before you mount him the first time, "'remember to say, brown eyes.' "'Brown eyes?' Will repeated, and Gillen couldn't help grinning. "'Not to me. To the horse.' It was an old ranger joke, and they all smiled. Then Holt brought them back to the business at hand. "'Will, you're confident you can find your way to Redmond?' Will nodded. He touched the pocket where he kept his own copy of the chart, and glanced at the sun for direction. "'Northwest,' he said tightly indicating the direction he had chosen. Holt nodded, satisfied. You'll strike the Salmon River before dusk. That will give you a good reference point, and the main highway is just a little way west of the river. Keep to a steady canter all the way. Don't try to race the horses. You'll just tire them out that way, and you'll be slower in the long run. Travel safely now. Holt swung up into Abelard's saddle, and Will mounted Tug. Gillen pointed to Will and spoke in Blaze's ear. Follow, Blaze, 
follow. The bay horse, intelligent as all ranger horses were, tossed its head as if in acknowledgement of the order. Before they parted, Will had one more question that had been bothering him. Halt, he said. The Gaulan ruins. What exactly are they? It's ironic, isn't it? Holt replied. They're the ruins of Castle Garlan, Morgarrett's former fiefdom. Chapter 28 The ride to Castle Redmond soon settled into a blur of weariness. The two horses maintained the steady lope for which they had been bred. The temptation, of course, was to urge Tug into a wild gallop, with Blaze following behind. But Will knew that such a course would be self-defeating. He was moving at the horse's best speed. As old Bob, the horse trainer, had told him, ranger horses could maintain a canter all day without tiring. It was a different matter for the rider. Added to the physical effort of moving constantly to the rhythm of whichever horse he was riding, and the two had distinctly different gaits, due to their difference in size, was the equally debilitating mental strain. What if Holt were wrong? What if the Kalkara had suddenly veered to the west and were heading now on a course that would intercept his? What if he had made some terrible mistake and failed to reach Redmond in time? That last fear, the fear of self-doubt, was the hardest one of all to deal with. In spite of the hard training he had undergone over the past months, he was still little more than a boy. What was more, he had always had Holt's judgment and experience to rely on in the past. Now he was alone, and he knew how much depended on his ability to carry out the task he had been set. The thoughts, the doubts, the fears crowded his tired mind, tumbling over each other, jostling for position. The Salmon River came and went beneath the steady rhythm of his horse's hooves. He paused to water the horses briefly at the bridge. Then, once on the King's Highway, he made excellent time with only short halts at regular intervals to change his mount. The day's shadows lengthened, and the trees overhanging the road grew dark and menacing. Each noise from the darkening trees, each vaguely seen movement in the shadows, brought his heart to his mouth with a lurch. Here, an owl hooted and stooped to fasten its claws around an unwary mouse. There, a badger prowled, hunting its prey like a grey shadow in the undergrowth of the forest. With each movement and noise, Will's imagination worked overtime. He began to see great black figures, much as he imagined a Kalkara would look, in every patch of shadow, in every dark clump of bushes that stirred with the light breeze. Reason told him that there was almost no chance that the Kalkara would be seeking him out. Imagination and fear replied that they were abroad somewhere, and who was to say they weren't close by? Imagination and fear won. And so the long, fear-filled night passed, until the low light of dawn found a weary figure hunched in the saddle of a sturdy, barrel-chested horse that drove steadily onwards to the northwest. Dozing in the saddle, Will snapped awake with a start, feeling the first warmth of the sun's rays upon him. Gently, he reined Tug in, and the little horse stood, head down, sides heaving. Will realised he had been riding far longer than he should have been, his fear having driven him to keep Tug running through the darkness, long after he should have rested him. He dismounted stiffly, aching in every joint, and paused to rub the horse's soft nose affectionately. "'Sorry, boy,' he said. Tug, Reacting to the touch and the voice that he now knew so well, tossed his head and shook his shaggy mane. If Will had asked it, he would have continued uncomplaining until he dropped. Will looked around. The cheerful light of early morning had dispelled all the dark fears of the night before. Now he felt slightly foolish as he remembered those moments of choking panic. Stiffly he dismounted, then loosened the girth straps on the saddle. He gave his horse ten minutes' respite, until Tug's breathing seemed to settle, and his sides ceased heaving. Then, marvelling at the recuperative powers and endurance of the ranger horse-breed, 
He tightened the girths on Blaze's saddle and swung astride the bay, groaning softly as he did so. Ranger horses might recover quickly. Ranger apprentices took a little longer. It was late morning when Castle Redmond finally came in sight. Will was riding Tug again, the small horse seemingly none the worse for the hard night he'd put in, as they crested the last row of hills and the green valley of Arald's barony stretched out before them. Exhausted, Will stopped for a few seconds, leaning tiredly on the pommel. They'd come so far, so quickly. He looked with relief on the familiar sight of the castle, and the tidy little village that nestled contentedly in its shadow. Smoke was rising from chimneys. Farmers were walking slowly home from their fields for their midday meal. The castle itself stood solid and reassuring in its bulk at the crest of the hill. It all looked so normal, Will said to his horse. Somehow, he realised, he'd been expecting to find things changed. The kingdom was about to go to war again for the first time in fifteen years. But here, life went on as normal. Then, realising he was wasting time, he urged Tug forward until he was stretched out in a gallop, both boy and horse eager to finish this final leg of their journey. People looked up in surprise at the rapid passing of the small, green and grey clad figure, hunched low over the neck of his dusty horse, with a larger bay horse following behind. One or two of the villagers recognised Will and called a greeting, but their words were lost in the rattle of hooves. The rattle turned to an echoing drumming as they swept across the lower drawbridge into the foreyard of the castle itself. Then the drumming became an urgent clattering on the cobblestones of the yard. Will drew back lightly on the reins, and Tug slid to a halt by the entrance to Baron Arold's tower. The two men-at-arms on duty there, surprised by his sudden appearance and breakneck pace, stepped forward and barred his path with their crossed pikes. "'Just a moment, you,' said one of them, a corporal. "'Where do you think you're off to in such a clatter and a rush?' Will opened his mouth to reply, but before words could form, an angry voice boomed from behind him. "'What the hell do you think you're doing, you idiot? Don't you recognise a king's ranger when you see one?' It was Sir Rodney, striding across the courtyard on his way to see the baron. The two sentries stiffened to attention as Will turned, gratefully, to the battlemaster. "'Sir Rodney,' he said, "'I have an urgent message from Holt for Lord Arald and yourself.' As Holt had observed to Will after the boar hunt, the battlemaster was a shrewd man. He took in Will's dishevelled clothing, the two dusty horses standing, heads drooping tiredly, and realised this was no time for a lot of foolish questions. He jerked a thumb at the doorway. "'Best come in and tell us, then.' He then turned to the sentries. "'Have these horses looked after. Feed and water them.' "'Not too much of either, please, Sir Rodney,' Will said quickly. "'Just a small amount of grain and water, and maybe you could have them rubbed down. I'll be needing them again soon.' Rodney's eyebrows rose at that. Will and the horses looked as if they could use a long rest. "'Something must be urgent,' he said, adding to the corporal, "'See to the horses, then, and have food brought to Baron Arald's study, and a jug of cold milk.' The two knights whistled in astonishment as Will told them the news. Word had already come that Morgareth was mustering his army and the baron had sent out messengers to assemble his own troops, both knights and men-at-arms. But the news of the Kalkara was something else entirely. No hint of that had reached Castle Redmond. "'You say Holt thinks they may be going after the king?' Baron Arald asked as Will finished speaking. Will nodded, then hesitated before he added, "'Yes, my lord, but I think there's another possibility.' He was loath to go further, but the baron gestured for him to continue, and he finally gave voice to the suspicion that had been building inside him through the long night and day. Sir, I think maybe there's a chance that they're after Hort himself. Once the suspicion was voiced, and the fear was out in the open to be examined and evaluated, he felt the better for it. 
Somewhat to his surprise, Baron Arold didn't dismiss the idea. He stroked his beard thoughtfully as he digested the words. Go on, he said, wanting to hear Will's reasoning. It's just that Halt felt more Gareth might be looking for revenge, looking to punish those who fought him last time, and I thought probably Halt did him the most harm of all, didn't he? That's true enough, said Rodney. And I thought maybe the Kalkara knew we were following them. The plainsmen had plenty of time to find them and tell them. And maybe they were leading Halt on until they found a place for an ambush. So while he thinks he's hunting them, he's actually the one being hunted. And the Gorlan ruins would be an ideal place for it, Arold agreed. In that tumble of rocks, they could be on him before he had a chance to use that longbow of his. Well, Rodney, there's no time to waste. You and I will go. Half armor, I think. We'll move faster that way. Lances, axes, and broadswords. And we'll take two horses each. We'll follow Will's example there. We'll leave in an hour. Have Carol gather another ten knights and follow us as soon as he can. Yes, my lord, the battlemaster replied. Baron Arold turned back to Will. You've done a good job, Will. We'll take care of this now. As for you, you look as if you could use eight hours solid sleep. Wearily, aching in every muscle and joint, Will drew himself erect. I'd like to come with you, my lord, he said. He sensed that the baron was about to disagree and added hurriedly, Sir, none of us knows what is going to happen, and Gillen is out there somewhere on foot. Besides, he hesitated. Go on, Will. The Baron said quietly, and when the boy looked up, Arolt saw the steel in his eyes. Halt is my master, sir, and he's in danger. My place is with him, Will said. The Baron assessed him shrewdly, then came to a decision. Very well, but at least you can get an hour's rest. There's a cot in that annex over there. He indicated a curtained off section of the study. Why don't you use it? Yes, sir, said Will gratefully. His eyes felt as if he'd had handfuls of sand rubbed into them. He had never been happier to obey an order in his life. Chapter 29 Through that long afternoon, Will felt as if he had lived his entire life on the saddle his only respite being the hourly changes from one horse to another. A brief pause to dismount, loosen the girth straps of the horse he had been riding, tighten those on the horse which had been following, then he would remount and ride on. Again and again, he marvelled at the amazing endurance shown by Tug and Blaze as they maintained their steady canter. He even had to rein them in a little, to keep pace with the battle horses ridden by the two knights. Big, powerful, and trained for war as they might be, they couldn't match the constant pace of the ranger horses, in spite of the fact that they were fresh when the small party had left Castle Redmond. They rode without speaking. There was no time for idle talk, and even if there had been, it would have been difficult to hear one another above the drumming thunder of the four heavy battle horses, the lighter rattle of tug and blazes' hooves, and the constant clank of equipment and weapons that accompanied them as they rode. Both men carried long war lances, hard ash poles more than three metres in length, tipped with a heavy iron point. In addition, each had a broadsword strapped to their saddles, huge, two-handed weapons that dwarfed the swords they normally wore in day-to-day -day use, and Rodney had a heavy battle-axe slung at the rear right pommel of his saddle. It was the lances on which they would place greatest trust, however. They would keep the Kalkara at a distance, and so reduce the chance that the knights might be frozen by the terrifying stare of the two beasts. Apparently, the hypnotic gaze was only effective at close quarters. If a man couldn't see the eyes clearly, there was little chance of their paralysing him with their gaze. The sun was dropping fast behind them, throwing their shadows out before them, long and distorted by the low-angle light. 
Arald glanced over his shoulder at the sun's position and called to Will. How long before dusk, Will? Will turned in his saddle and frowned at the descending ball of light before answering. Less than an hour, my lord. The baron shook his head doubtfully. It'll be a close run to get there before full dark, then, he said. He urged his battle horse onward, increasing speed a little. Tug and Blaze matched the increase without effort. None of them wanted to be hunting the Kalkara in the dark. The hour's rest of the castle had done wonders for Will, but it seemed that it had happened in another lifetime now. He thought over the cursory briefing that Arold had given as they mounted to leave Redmond. If they found the Kalkara at the Gaulan ruins, Will was to hold back while the Baron and Sir Rodney charged the two monsters. There were no complex tactics involved, just a headlong charge that might take the two killers by surprise. If Halt's there, I'm sure he'll take a hand too. But I want you well back out of harm's way, Will. That bow of yours won't make any impression on the Kalkara. Yes, sir, Will had said. He had no intention of getting close to the Kalkara. He was more than content to leave things to the two knights, protected by their shields, helmets, and half armor of chain mail shirts and leggings. However, Arold's next words quickly dispelled any overconfidence he might have had in their ability to deal with the beasts. If the damn things get the better of us, I'll want you to ride for more help. Carol and the others will be somewhere behind us. Find them, then go after the Kalkara with them. Track those beasts down and kill them. Will had said nothing to that. The fact that Arold even contemplated failure, when he and Rodney were the two foremost knights within a two hundred kilometer radius, spoke volumes of his concern about the Kalkara. For the first time, Will realized that in this contest the odds were heavily against them. The sun was trembling on the brink of the world, the shadows at their longest, and they still had several kilometers to go. Baron Arold raised a hand and brought the party to a stop. He glanced at Rodney and jerked a thumb at the bundle of pitch soaked torches each man carried behind his saddle. Torches, Rodney, he said briefly. The battlemaster demurred for a moment. Are you sure, my lord? They'll give away our position if the Kalkara are watching. Arold shrugged. They'll hear us coming anyway. And among the trees, we'll move too slowly without the light. Let's take the chance. He was already striking his flint and steel together, igniting a spark that set his small pile of tinder smoking, then flaring into flame. He held the torch in the flame, and the thick, sticky pine pitch with which it was impregnated suddenly caught and burst into yellow flame. Rodney leaned toward him with another torch and lit it in the baron's flame. Then, holding the torches high, their lances held in place by leather thongs looped around their right wrists, they resumed their gallop, thundering into the darkness beneath the trees as they finally left the broad road they'd been following since noon. It was another ten minutes before they heard the screaming. It was an unearthly sound that twisted the stomach into knots of fear and turned the blood cold. Involuntarily, the Baron and Sir Rodney reined in as they heard it. Their horses plunged wildly against the reins. It came from straight ahead of them and rose and fell until the night air quaked with the horror of it. Good God in heaven! the Baron exclaimed. What is that? His face was ashen as the hellish sound soared through the night toward them, to be answered immediately by another identical howl. But Will had heard the terrible noise before. He felt the blood leave his face now as he realized his fears were being proven correct. It's the Kalkara, he said. They're hunting. And he knew there was only one person out there that they could be after. They had turned back and were hunting Halt. Look, my lord. Rodney said, pointing to the rapidly darkening night sky. Through a break in the tree cover they saw it, a sudden flare of light reflecting in the sky, evidence of a fire in the near distance. That's Halt, the Baron said, bound to be, and he'll need help. 
he rammed his spurs into the tired battle horse's flanks, urging the beast forward into a lumbering gallop, the torch in his hand, streaming flame and sparks behind him as Sir Rodney and Will galloped in his tracks. It was an eerie sensation, following those flaming, spitting torches through the trees, their elongated tongues of flame blowing back behind the two riders, casting weird and terrifying shadows among the trees, while ahead of them the glow of the large fire, presumably lit by Hort, grew stronger and nearer with each stride. They broke out of the trees with virtually no warning, and before them was a scene from nightmares. There was a short space of open grass, then the ground beyond was a litter of tumbled rocks and boulders. Giant pieces of masonry, still held together by mortar, lay scattered on their sides and edges, sometimes half buried in the soft, grassy earth. The ruined walls of Castle Gorland surrounded the scene on three sides, nowhere rising to more than five metres in height, destroyed and cast down by a vengeful kingdom after Morgareth had been driven out of his keep and back into the mountains of rain and night. The resulting chaos of rocks and sections of tumbled wall was like the playground of a giant child, scattered in all directions, piled carelessly on top of one another, leaving virtually no clear ground at all. The whole scene was illuminated by the leaping, twisting flames of a bonfire some forty metres in front of them, and beside it a horrific figure crouched, screaming hatred and fury, plucking uselessly at the mortal wound in its chest that had finally brought it down. Over two and a half metres tall, with shaggy, matted, scale-like hair covering its entire body, the Kalkara had long, talon-clad arms that reached to beneath its knees. Relatively short, powerful hind legs gave it the ability to cover the ground at a deceptive speed in a series of leaps and bounds. All of this the three riders took in as they emerged from the trees. But what they noticed most was the face, savage and ape-like, with huge yellowed canine teeth and red glowing eyes filled with hatred and the blind desire to kill. The face turned toward them now, and the beast screamed a challenge, tried to rise, and stumbled back into a half-crouch again. "'What's wrong with it?' Rodney asked, reining in his horse. Will pointed to the cluster of arrows that protruded from its chest. There must have been eight of them, all placed within a hand's breadth of each other. "'Look!' he cried. "'Look at the arrows!' Hawked, with his uncanny ability to aim and fire in a blur of movement, must have sent a volley of arrows, one after the other, to smash into the armour-like matted hair, each one widening a gap in the monster's defences until the final arrow had penetrated deep into its flesh. Its black blood ran in sheets down its torso, and again it screamed its hatred at them. "'Rodney!' yelled Baron Arold. "'With me! Now!' Dropping the lead rein to his spare horse, he tossed the flaming torch to one side, couched his lance, and charged. Rodney was a half-second behind him, the two battle-horses thundering across the open space. The Kalkara, its lifeblood saturating the ground at its feet, rose to meet them, in time to take the two lance-points, one after the other, in the chest. It was all but dead. Even so, the weight and strength of the monster checked the onward rush of the battle-horses. They reared back on their haunches as both knights leaned forward in the stirrups to drive the lance points home. The sharp iron penetrated, smashing through the matted hair. The force of the charge drove the Kalkara from its feet and hurled it backward into the flames of the fire behind it. For an instant, nothing happened. Then there was a blinding flash and a pillar of red flame that reached ten metres into the night sky. And quite simply, the Kalkara disappeared. The two battle horses reared in terror, Rodney and the Baron only just managing to retain their seats. They backed away from the fire. There was a terrible reek of charred hair and flesh filling the air. Vaguely, Will remembered Halt discussing the way to deal with the Kalkara. He had said that they were rumoured to be particularly susceptible to fire. Some rumour, he thought heavily, trotting Tug forward to join the two knights. Rodney was rubbing his eyes, 
still dazzled by the enormous flash. What the devil caused that? he asked. The baron gingerly retrieved his lance from the fire. The wood was charred and the point blackened. It must be the waxy substance that mats their hair together into that hard shell, he replied in a wondering tone of voice. It must be highly flammable. Well, whatever it was, we did it, Rodney replied, a note of satisfaction in his voice. The baron shook his head. Halt did it, he corrected his battle master. We merely finished him off. Rodney nodded, accepting the correction. The baron glanced at the fire, still pouring a torrent of sparks into the air, but settling back now from the huge explosion of red flame. He must have lit this fire when he sensed they were circling back on him. It lit up the area, so he had light to shoot by. He shot all right, Sir Rodney put in. Those arrows must have all struck within a few square centimeters. They looked around, searching for some sign of the ranger. Then, below the ruined walls of the castle, Will caught sight of a familiar object. He dismounted and ran to retrieve it, and his heart sank as he picked up Hort's powerful longbow, smashed and splintered into two pieces. He must have fired from over here, he said, indicating the point below the ruined wall where he had found the bow. They looked up, imagining the scene, trying to recreate it. The Baron took the shattered weapon from Will as he remounted Tug. And the second Kalkara reached him as he killed its brother. He said, "The question is, where is Halt now, and where is the other Calcara?" That was when they heard the screaming start again. Chapter Thirty. Inside the ruined, overgrown courtyard, Halt crouched among the tumbled masonry that had once been Morgarret's stronghold. His leg. Numb where the Kalkara had clawed him, was beginning to throb painfully, and he could feel the blood seeping past the rough bandage he had thrown around it. Somewhere close by, he knew the second Kalkara was searching for him. He heard its shuffling movements from time to time, and once even its rasping breath as it moved close to his hiding place between two fallen sections of wall. It was only a matter of time before it found him. He knew, and when that happened. He was finished. He was wounded and unarmed. His bow was gone, smashed in that first terrifying charge when he had fired arrow after arrow into the first of the two monsters. He knew the power of his bow and the penetrative qualities of his razor-sharp, heavy arrowheads. He couldn't believe that the monster had continued to absorb that hail of arrows and still come on, seemingly undaunted. By the time it faltered. It was already too late for Halt to turn his attention to its companion. The second Kalkara was almost upon him, its massive, taloned paw smashing the bow from his grasp, so that he barely had time to scramble for safety onto the ruined wall. As it clawed its way after him, he had drawn his sax knife and tried to strike at the terrible head, but the beast had been too fast for him, and the heavy knife merely glanced off one of its armored forearms. At the same time, he had found himself confronted by its red, hate-filled eyes, and felt his mind leaving him, his muscles freezing in terror as he was drawn to the horrific beast before him. It took an immense effort to wrench his eyes away from the creature's gaze, and he staggered back, losing the sax knife as the bear-like claws swiped at him and ripped down the length of his thigh. Then he had run, unarmed and bleeding. Trusting to the maze-like confusion of the ruins to evade the monster behind him, he had sensed the change in the Kalkara's movements around late afternoon. Their steady and previously undeviating path to the northeast suddenly changed as the two beasts abruptly separated, each turning through ninety degrees and moving in different directions into the forest that surrounded them. Their trails, up until then so easy to follow. Also showed signs of concealment, so that only a tracker as skilled as a ranger would have been able to follow them. For the first time in years, Halt felt a cold stone of fear in his belly as he realized that the Kalkara were now hunting him.
The ruins were close by, and he elected to make a stand there, rather than in the woods. He knew the Kalkara would come after him once night fell, so he prepared as best he could, gathering dead fall wood to form the bonfire. He even found half a jar of cooking oil in the ruins of the kitchen. It was rancid and foul smelling, but it would still burn. He poured it over the pile of wood and moved back to a spot where he could place the wall at his back. He had fashioned a supply of torches and kept them burning as darkness fell and he waited for the implacable killers to come for him. He sensed them before he saw them. Then he made out the two shambling forms, darker patches against the darkness of the trees. They saw him immediately, of course. The flickering torch jammed into the wall behind him made sure of that. But they missed the pile of oil soaked wood, and that was what he had been counting on. As they screamed their hunting cries, he tossed the burning torch into the pile, and the flames leaped up instantly, flaring yellow in the darkness. For a moment, the beasts hesitated. Fire was their one fear. But they saw the ranger was nowhere near the flames, and they came on, straight into the hail of arrows that Hort met them with. If they'd had another hundred metres to cover, he might have managed to stop them both. He still had over a dozen arrows in his quiver. But time and distance were against him, and he had barely escaped with his life. Now he huddled beneath two pieces of masonry that formed an A shaped refuge, hidden in a shallow indentation in the ground. His cloak concealing him as it had for years. His only hope now was that Will would arrive with Harold and Rodney. If he could evade the creature until help came, he might have a chance. He tried not to think of the other possibility that Gillen would arrive before them, alone and armed only with his bow and sword. Now that he had seen the Kalkara close up, Halt knew that one man had little chance of standing against it. If Gillen arrived before the knights, he and Halt would both die here. The creature was quartering the old courtyard now, like a hunting dog in search of game, adopting a methodical search pattern, back and forth, examining every space, every cranny, every possible hiding place. This time he knew it would find him. His hand touched the hilt of his small throwing knife, the only weapon left to him. It would be a puny, almost useless defence, but it was all he had left. Then he heard it the unmistakable heavy drumming of battle horses' hooves. He looked up, watching the Kalkara through a small gap between the rocks that concealed him. It had heard them too. It was standing erect, its face turned toward the sound outside the ruined walls. The horses stopped. And he heard the ringing scream of the mortally wounded Kalkara outside as it challenged these new enemies. The hoofbeats rose again, gaining speed and momentum. Then there was a scream and a gigantic red flash that towered for a moment into the sky. Dimly, Halt reasoned that the first Kalkara must have been thrust into the fire. He began to inch back, wriggling out of his hiding place. Perhaps he could outflank the remaining Kalkara, moving to the side and scaling the wall before it noticed him. The chances seemed good. Its attention was drawn now to whatever was happening outside. But even as he had the thought, he realized it was no option. Though the Kalkara had apparently forgotten him for the moment, it was moving stealthily toward the tumbled masonry that formed a rough stairway to the top of the wall. In a few more minutes, it would be in position to drop on his unsuspecting friends on the other side, taking them by surprise. He had to stop it. Halt was clear of the hiding place now, the small knife sliding free of the sheath, almost of its own volition, as he ran across the courtyard, dodging and weaving among the scattered rubble. The Kalkara heard him before he had gone half a dozen paces, and it turned back on him. Terrifying in its silence as it loped, ape like, to cut him off before he could warn his friends. Halt stopped suddenly, stock still, eyes locked on the shambling figure coming at him. In another few metres, its hypnotic gaze would seize control of his mind. He felt the irresistible urge to look into those red eyes growing stronger. Then he closed his own eyes, 
his brow furrowed in fierce concentration, and brought his knife hand up, back and forward in one smooth, instinctive memory throw, seeing the target moving in his mind's eye, mentally aligning the throw and the spin of the knife to the point in space where knife and target would arrive simultaneously. Only a ranger could have made that throw, and only one of a handful of them. It took the Kalkara in its right eye, and the beast screamed in pain and fury as it stopped to clutch at the sudden lance of agony that began in its eye and seared all the way to the pain sensors in its brain. Then Halt was running past it for the wall, scrambling up the rocks. Will saw him as a shadowy figure as he scrambled onto the top of the ruined wall. But shadowy or not, there was something unmistakable about it. Halt! he cried. "'pointing so that the two knights saw him as well. "'All three of them saw the ranger pause, "'look back and hesitate. "'Then a huge shape began to appear a few metres behind him "'as the Kalkara, whose wound was painful but nowhere near mortal, "'came after him. "'Baron Arold went to remount. "'Then, realising that no horse could pick its way "'through the tumble of rocks and masonry beside the wall, "'he dragged his huge broadsword from its saddle scabbard "'and ran toward the ruins.' "'Get back, Will!' he shouted as he advanced, and Will nervously edged Tug back to the fringe of the trees. On the wall, Halt heard the shout and saw Arold running forward. Sir Rodney was close behind him, a huge battle-axe whirring in circles around his head. "'Jump, Halt! Jump!' the Baron shouted, and Halt needed no further invitation. He leaped the three metres from the wall, rolling to break his fall as he landed. Then he was up on his feet, running awkwardly to meet the two knights as the wound in his leg reopened. Will watched, his heart in his mouth, as Halt ran toward the two knights. The Kalkara hesitated a moment, then, screaming a blood-curdling challenge, it leaped after him. But, whereas Halt had rolled to recover, the Kalkara simply transformed the three-metre drop into a huge, bounding leap, its unbelievably powerful rear legs driving it up and forward, covering the ground between it and Halt in that one movement. The massive arm swung, catching Halt a glancing blow and sending him rolling forward, unconscious. But the beast had no time to finish him off, as Baron Arold stepped up to meet it, the broadsword humming in a deadly arc for its neck. The Kalkara was wickedly fast, and it ducked the killing blow, then slammed its talons into Arold's exposed back before he could recover from the stroke. They slashed the chainmail as if it were wool, and Arold grunted in pain and surprise as the force of the blow drove him to his knees, the broadsword falling from his hands, blood streaming from half a dozen deep slashes in his back. He would have died then and there had it not been for Sir Rodney. The battlemaster whirled the heavy war-axe as if it were a toy, and crashed it into the Kalkara's side. The armour of wax-matted hair protected the beast, but the sheer force of the blow staggered it so that it reeled back from the night, screaming in fury and frustration. Sir Rodney advanced, placing himself protectively between the Kalkara and the prone figures of Hort and the Baron, his feet set, the axe drawing back for another crushing blow. And then... Strangely, he let the weapon fall from his grasp and stood before the monster, totally at its mercy as the power of the Kalkara's gaze, now channeled through its one good eye, robbed him of his will and his ability to think. The Kalkara screamed its victory to the night sky. Black blood streamed down its face. Never in its life had it felt such pain as these three puny men had inflicted on it, and now they would die for presuming to stand against it. But the primitive intelligence that drove it wanted its moment of triumph, and it screamed again and again over the three helpless men. Will watched, horrified. A thought was forming. An idea was lurking somewhere at the edge of his mind. He looked to one side, saw the flickering torch that Baron Arold had discarded. Fire. The one weapon that could defeat the Kalkara but he was forty metres away. He whipped an arrow from his quiver, slipping from the saddle and running lightly to the flickering torch. 
A good supply of sticky, melted pitch had run down the handle of the torch, and he quickly rolled the arrowhead in the soft, clinging stuff, forming a huge goblet of it on the arrow. Then he placed it in the flame until it flared to life. Forty meters away, the huge, evil creature was satisfying its need for triumph. Its screams rolling and echoing through the night as it stood over the two bodies, halt unconscious, Baron Arold in a daze of pain. Sir Rodney still stood, frozen in place, hands dangling helplessly by his side as he waited for his death. Now the Kalkara raised one massive, taloned paw to strike him down, and all the knight could feel was the paralyzing terror of its gaze. Will brought the arrow back to full draw. Wincing at the pain as the flame singed against his bow hand, he raised his aim point a little to allow for the extra weight of the pitch and released. The arrow soared in a spark trailing arc, the wind of its passage subduing the flame to a mere coal. The Kalkara saw the flash of light coming and turned to look, sealing its own fate as the arrow struck it square in its massive chest. It barely penetrated an inch into the hard, scale-like hair, but as the arrow came to a halt, the little flame flared again. The bonding material in the hair around it caught, and the flame began to spread with incredible speed. Now the Kalkara's screams had terror in them as it felt the touch of fire, the one thing in life it feared. The monster beat at the flames on its chest with its paws, but that served only to spread the fire to its arms. There was a sudden rush of red flame, and in seconds the Kalkara was engulfed, burning from head to toe, rushing blindly in circles in a vain attempt to escape. The screams were non-stop, piercing, reaching higher and higher into a scale of agony that the mind could barely comprehend, as the rush of flames grew fiercer with each second. And then the screaming stopped, and the creature was dead. Chapter Thirty One. The inn at Wensley Village was full of music and laughter and noise. Will sat at a table with Horace, Alice, and Jenny, while the innkeeper plied them with a succulent dinner of roast goose and farm fresh vegetables, followed by a delicious blueberry pie whose flaky pastry won even Jenny's approval. It had been Horace's idea to celebrate Will's return to Castle Redmond with a feast. The two girls had agreed immediately, eager for a break in their day-to-day -day lives, which now seemed rather humdrum compared to the events that Will had been part of. Naturally, word of the battle with the Kalkara had gone around the village like wildfire, an appropriate simile, Will thought, as it occurred to him. As he entered the inn with his friends that evening, an expectant hush had fallen over the room, and every eye had turned toward him. He was grateful for the deep cowl on his cloak, which concealed his rapidly reddening features. His three companions sensed his embarrassment. Jenny, as ever, was the quickest to react and to break the silence that filled the inn. "Come on, you solemn lot!" she cried to the musicians by the fireplace. "Let's have some music in here, and some chatter, if you please." She added the second suggestion with a meaningful glance at the other occupants in the room. The musicians took their cue from her. Jenny was a difficult person to refuse. They quickly struck up a popular local folk tune, and the sound filled the room. The other villagers gradually realized that their attention was making Will uncomfortable. They remembered their manners and began talking among themselves again, only occasionally casting glances his way, marveling that one so apparently young could have been part of such momentous events. The four former wardmates took their seats at a table at the back of the room, where they could talk without interruption. George sent his apologies. Alice said as they took their seats, "He snowed under with paperwork. The entire scribe school is working day and night." Will nodded his understanding. The impending war with Morgareth and the need to mobilize troops and call in old alliances must have created a mountain of paperwork. So much had happened in the ten days since the battle with the Kalkara. Making camp by the ruins, Rodney and Will had tended to the wounds of Baron Arold and Holt, finally settling the two men into a restful sleep. The following morning saw the arrival of a leg-weary Gillen, 
riding a sway-backed plough horse. The tall ranger gratefully reclaimed Blaze. Then, after being reassured that his former master was in no danger, he set off almost immediately for his own fife. After Will promised to return the plough horse to its owner. Later in the day, Will, Hort, Rodney, and Arold had returned to Castle Redmond, where they were all plunged into the non-stop activity of preparing the castle's fighting men for war. There were a thousand and one details to be handled, messages to be delivered, and summonses sent out. With Holt still recuperating from his wound, a great deal of this work had fallen to Will. In times like these, he realized, a ranger had little chance for relaxation, which made this evening such a welcome diversion. The innkeeper bustled importantly to their table and set down four glass tankards and a jug of the non-alcoholic beer he brewed from ginger root before them. No charge for this table tonight, he said. We're privileged to have you in our establishment, Ranger. He moved away, calling to one of his serving boys to come and attend the Ranger's table, and be quick, smart about it. Alice raised one eyebrow in amazement. Nice to be with the celebrity, she said. Old Skinner usually holds onto a coin so tight the king's head suffocates. Will made a dismissive gesture. People exaggerate things, he said. But Horace leaned forward, his elbows on the table. So tell us about the fight, he said, eager for details. Jenny looked wide-eyed at Will. I can't believe how brave you were, she said admiringly. I would have been terrified. Actually, I was petrified. Will told them with a rueful grin. The Baron and Sir Rodney were the brave ones. They charged in and took those creatures on at close quarters. I was forty or fifty meters away the whole time. He described the events of the battle, without going into too much detail, in his description of the Calcara. They were dead and gone now, he thought, and best forgotten as soon as possible. Some things didn't need dwelling on. The three others listened, Jenny wide-eyed and excited, Horace eager for details of the fight. And Alice, calm and dignified as ever, but totally engrossed in his story, as he described his solo ride to summon help, Horace shook his head in admiration. Those ranger horses must be a breed apart, he said. Will grinned at him, unable to resist the jibe that rose to his mind. The trick is staying on them, he said, and was pleased to see a matching grin spread over Horace's face as they both remember the scene at the Harvest Day Fair. He realized, with a small glow of pleasure, that his relationship with Horace had evolved into a firm friendship, with each viewing the other as an equal. Eager to slip out of the spotlight, he asked Horace how life was progressing in battle school. The grin on the bigger boy's face widened. A lot better these days, thanks to Holt, he said. And as Will adroitly plied him with more questions, he described life in the battle school for them, joking about his mistakes and shortcomings, laughing as he described the many punishment details he attracted. Will noticed how Horace, once inclined to be boastful and a little arrogant, was far more self-effacing these days. He suspected that Horace was doing better as an apprentice warrior than he let on. It was a pleasant evening. All the more so after the strain and terror of the hunt for the Kalkara. As the servers cleared their plates, Jenny smiled expectantly at the two boys. Right, now who's going to dance with me? She said brightly, and Will was just too slow in responding. Horace claiming her hand and leading her to the dance floor. As they joined the dancers, Will glanced uncertainly at Alice. He was never quite sure what the tall girl was thinking. He thought that perhaps it might be good manners to ask her to dance as well. He cleared his throat nervously. Um, would you like to dance too, Alice? He said awkwardly. She favoured him with the barest trace of a smile. Perhaps not, Will. I'm no great shakes as a dancer. I seem to be all legs. In fact, she was an excellent dancer, but a diplomat to the core. She sensed that Will had only asked her out of politeness. He nodded several times, and they lapsed into silence, but a friendly sort of silence. After some minutes, she turned toward him, placing her chin on her hand to consider him closely. 
A big day for you tomorrow, she said, and he flashed. He'd been summoned to appear before the Baron's entire court the following day. I don't know what that's all about, he muttered. Alice smiled at him. He possibly wants to thank you in public, she said. I'm told barons tend to do that to people who have saved their lives. He began to say something, but she laid one soft, cool hand over his, and he stopped. He looked into those calm, smiling grey eyes. Alice had never struck him as pretty, but now he realised that her elegance and grace and those grey eyes, framed by her fine blonde hair, created a natural beauty that far surpassed mere prettiness. Surprisingly, she leaned closer to him and whispered, We're all proud of you, Will, and I think I'm proudest of all. And she kissed him. Her lips on his were incredibly, indescribably soft. Hours later, before he finally fell asleep, he could still feel them. Chapter 32 Will stood, transfixed by stage fright, just inside the massive doors to the Barron's audience hall. The building itself was enormous. It was the main room of the castle, the room where the Baron conducted all his official business with the members of his court. The ceiling seemed to stretch upward forever. Shafts of light poured down into the room from windows set high in the massive walls. At the far end of the room, seeming to be kilometres away, the Baron sat, wearing his finest robes on a raised, throne-like chair. Between him and Will was the biggest crowd Will had ever seen. Holt propelled his apprentice gently forward with a shove on the back. "'Get on with it,' he muttered. There were hundreds of people in the great hall, and every eye was turned toward Will. All of the Baron's craftmasters were there, in their official robes. All of his knights, and all the ladies of the court, every one in their best and finest clothes. Farther down the hall were the men-at-arms from the Baron's army, the other apprentices, and the trademasters from the village. He saw a flutter of colour as Jenny, uninhibited as ever, waved a scarf at him. Alice, standing beside her, was a little more discreet. She unobtrusively kissed her fingertips to him. He stood awkwardly, shifting his weight from one foot to another. He wished that Holt had let him wear his ranger's cloak, so he could blend into the background and disappear. Holt shoved him again. Guess a move on, he hissed. Will turned to him. Aren't you coming with me? he asked. Holt shook his head. Not invited. Now get going. He shoved him once more, then limped, favouring his injured leg, to a seat. Finally, realising he had no other course to follow, Will began to walk down the long, long aisle. He heard the muttering voices as he went, heard his name being whispered from one mouth to another. And then the clapping started. It began with one night's lady and rapidly spread throughout the entire hall as everyone joined in. It was deafening a thundering, echoing roar of applause that continued until he reached the foot of the Baron's chair. As Hort had instructed him, he dropped to one knee and bowed his head forward. The Baron stood up and raised his hand for silence, and the clapping died away to echoes. "'Stand up, Will,' he said softly, and reached out a hand to help the boy to his feet. In a daze, Will obeyed. The Baron rested a hand on his shoulder, and turned him to face the huge throng before him. His deep voice carried effortlessly to the farthest corner of the hall when he spoke. This is Will, apprentice to the ranger halt of this fiefdom. See him now, and know him, all of you. He has proven his fidelity, courage, and initiative to this fief and to the kingdom of Araluen. There was a murmur of appreciation from the people watching. Then the clapping began again, this time accompanied by cheering. Will realised the cheers had begun in the section of the crowd where the battle school apprentice warriors stood. He could make out Horace's grinning face, leading the chorus. The Baron held up a hand for silence. 
wincing as the movement brought pain to his cracked ribs and the carefully bandaged and sutured gashes in his back. The cheering and clapping slowly died away. Will, he said, in a voice that echoed to the farthest corners of the massive room, I owe you my life. There could be no thanks adequate for that. However, it is in my power to grant you a wish that you once made of me. Will looked up at him, frowning. A wish, sir, he said, more than a little puzzled by the Baron's words. The Baron nodded. I made a mistake, Will. You asked me if you could train as a warrior. It was your wish to become one of my knights, and I refused you. Now I can rectify that mistake. It would do me honour to have one so brave and resourceful as one of my knights. Say the word now, and you have my permission to transfer to the battle school as one of Sir Rodney's apprentices. Will's heart pounded in his ribs. He thought how, all his life, he had yearned to be a knight. He remembered his deep and bitter disappointment on the day of the choosing, when Sir Rodney and the Baron had refused his request. Sir Rodney stepped forward, and the Baron gestured for him to speak. "'My lord,' said the battle-master, "'it was I who refused this boy as an apprentice, as you know. "'Now I want all here to know that I was wrong to do so. "'I, my knights, and my apprentices all agree "'that there could be no more worthy member of the battle-school than Will.' "'There was a great roar of approval from the assembled knights and apprentice warriors.' With a slithering clash of steel, they unsheathed their swords and clashed them together above their heads, shouting Will's name. Again, Horace was one of the first to do so, and the last to stop. Gradually, the tumult died down, and the knights resheathed their swords. At a sign from Baron Arold, two pages stepped forward, bearing with them a sword and a beautifully enamelled shield, which they laid at Will's feet. The shield was painted with a representation of a fierce boar's head. "'This will be your coat of arms when you graduate, Will,' said the Baron gently, "'to remind the world of the first time we learned of your courage and loyalty to a comrade.' The boy went down on one knee and touched the smooth, enamelled surface of the shield. He drew the sword slowly and reverently from its scabbard. It was a beautiful weapon, a masterpiece of the swordsmith's art, the blade was razor-keen and slightly blued. The hilt and cross-piece were inlaid with gold, and the boar's head symbol was repeated on the pommel. The sword itself seemed to have a life of its own. Perfectly balanced, it seemed light as a feather in his grasp. He glanced from the beautiful jeweled sword to the plain leather grip of his ranger knife. "'There are knight's weapons, Will,' the Baron urged." "'But you've proved over and again that you're worthy of them. "'Just say the word, and they're yours.' "'Will slid the sword back into its scabbard and stood slowly up. "'Here was everything he had ever wished for. "'And yet... "'He thought of the long days in the forest with Halt, "'the fierce satisfaction that he felt when one of his arrows struck home, "'exactly where he had aimed it exactly as he had seen it in his mind before releasing it. He thought of the hours spent learning to track animals and men, learning the art of concealment. He thought of Tug, of the pony's courage and devotion. And he thought of the sheer pleasure that came when he heard Hort's simple, Well done, as he completed a task to his satisfaction. And suddenly he knew. He looked up at the Baron and said in a firm voice, I am a ranger, my lord. There was a murmur of surprise from the crowd. The baron stepped forward and said in a low voice, Are you sure, Will? Don't turn this down just because you think Hort might be offended or disappointed. He insisted that this is up to you. He's already agreed to abide by your decision. Will shook his head. He was more certain than ever now. I thank you for the honour, my lord. He glanced at the battle-master, and saw to his surprise that Sir Rodney was smiling and nodding his head in approval. And I thank the battle-master and his knights for their generous offer. But I am a ranger. He hesitated. 
I mean, no offence by this, my lord, he finished awkwardly. A huge smile creased the baron's features, and he gripped Will's hand in his enormous grip. And I take none, Will, none at all. Your loyalty to your craft and your craftmaster does honour to you and to all of us who know you. He gave Will's hand one final firm shake and released him. Will bowed and turned away to walk down that long, long aisle again. Again, the cheering started, and this time he kept his head high as the cheers rolled around him and echoed to the rafters of the great hall. Then, as he neared the massive doors once more, he saw a sight that stopped him in his tracks, stunned with surprise. For, standing a little aside from the crowd, wrapped in his grey and green mottled cloak, his eyes shadowed by the cowl, was halt, and he was smiling. Epilogue. Later that afternoon, after all the noise and celebrations had died down, Will sat alone on the tiny veranda of Holt's small cottage. In his hand, he held a small bronze amulet, shaped like an oak leaf, with a steel chain threaded through a ring at the top. It's our symbol, his teacher had explained as he handed it to him after the events at the castle, the ranger's equivalent of a coat of arms. Then he fumbled inside his own collar and produced an identically shaped oak leaf on a chain around his neck. The shape was identical, but the colour was different. The oak leaf Holt wore was made of silver. Bronze is the apprentice collar, Holt told him. When you finish your learning, you'll receive a silver oak leaf like this one. We all wear them in the Ranger Corps, either silver or bronze. He looked away from the boy for a few minutes. Then added, his voice a little husky, "Strictly speaking, you shouldn't receive it until you've passed your first assessment. But I doubt anyone will argue about it. The way things have turned out." Now the curiously shaped piece of metal gleamed dully in Will's hand, as he thought of the decision he'd made. It seemed so strange to him that he had voluntarily given up the one thing that he had spent most of his life hoping for. The chance to go through battle school and take his place as a knight in Castle Redmond's army. He twirled the bronze oak leaf on its chain around his index finger, letting it wind right up to the finger, then spiral loose again. He sighed deeply. Life could be so complicated. Deep within himself, he felt he had made the right decision, and yet, way down deeper still, there was a tiny thread of doubt. With a start, he realized that there was someone standing beside him. It was Holt. He recognized as he turned quickly. The ranger stooped and sat beside the boy on the rough pine planking of the narrow veranda. Before them, the low sun of the late afternoon filtered through the luminous green leaves of the forest, the light seeming to dance and gyrate as the light breeze stirred the leaves. A big day, he said softly, and Will nodded. And a big decision that you made," the ranger said after several more minutes' silence between them. This time, Will turned to face him. "Halt! Did I make the right decision?" he asked. Finally, the anguish clear in his voice. Halt placed his elbows on his knees and leaned forward a little, squinting into the dappled glare through the trees. As far as I'm concerned, yes, I chose you as an apprentice. And I can see all the potential you have in that role. I've even come to almost enjoy having you around and getting under my feet," he added, with the barest hint of a smile. "But my feelings, my wishes, aren't important in this. The right decision for you is the one you want most." I always wanted to become a knight," Will said, then realized with a sense of surprise that he'd phrased the statement in the past tense. And yet he knew that a part of him still wanted it. It is possible, of course," said Holt quietly, "to want to do two different things at the same time. Then it just becomes a choice of knowing which one you want most." Not for the first time, Will felt that Holt had some way of reading his mind. If you can sum it up in one thought, 
What's the main reason you feel a little disappointed that you refuse the Baron's offer? Holt continued. Will considered the question. I guess, he said slowly, I feel that by turning down battle school, I'm somehow letting my father down. Holt's eyebrows shot up in surprise. Your father, he repeated, and Will nodded. He was a mighty warrior, he told the ranger. A knight. He died at Hackham Heath, fighting the war gulls. A hero. You know all this, do you? Holt asked him, and Will nodded again. This was the dream that had sustained him through the long, lonely years of never knowing who he was or what he was meant to be. The dream had become reality for him now. He was a man any son would be proud of, he said finally, and Holt nodded. That's certainly true. There was something in his voice that made Will hesitate. Holt wasn't simply agreeing out of politeness. Will turned quickly to him, realizing the full implications of the ranger's words. You knew him, Holt. You knew my father. There was a light of hope in the boy's eyes that cried out for the truth, and the ranger nodded soberly. Yes, I did. I didn't know him for long. But I think I could say I knew him well, and you're right. You can be extremely proud of him. He was a mighty warrior, wasn't he? said Will. He was a soldier, Holt agreed, and a brave fighter. I knew it, Will said happily. He was a great knight. A sergeant, Holt said softly, and not unkindly. Will's jaw hung open. The next words he'd been about to say frozen in his throat. Finally, he managed in a confused voice. A sergeant? Holt nodded. He could see the disappointment in the boy's eyes, and he put an arm around his shoulders. Don't judge a man's quality by his position in life, Will. Your father, Daniel, was a loyal and brave soldier. He didn't have the opportunity to go to battle school because he began life as a farmer. But if he had, he would have been one of the greatest of knights. But he... The boy began sadly. The ranger stopped him, continuing in that same kind, soft, compelling voice. Because without taking any of the vows or the special training that knights have, he lived up to the highest ideals of knighthood and chivalry and valour. It was actually a few days after the battle at Hackham Heath, while Morgareth and his war gauls were fighting their way back to Three Step Pass. A sudden counter-attack took us by surprise, and your father saw a comrade surrounded by a troop of war gauls. The man was on the ground, and was within a second of being cut to pieces when your father took a hand. The light in the boy's eyes had begun to shine again. He did? Will asked his lips just framing the words, and Holt nodded. He did. He left the safety of the battle line and leaped forward, armed only with a spear. He stood over his injured comrade and protected him from the war gulls. He killed one with a spear, then another smashed the head of the spear, leaving Daniel with only a spear shaft. So he used it like a quarter staff and knocked down two others, left, right, just like that. He flicked his hand to left and right to demonstrate. Will's eyes were intent on him now, seeing the battle as the ranger described it. He was wounded then, as the spear shaft broke under another attack. It would have been enough to kill most men, but he simply took the sword from one of the war gods he'd killed and struck down three more, all the time bleeding from a massive wound in his side. Three of them? Will asked. Three. He had the speed of a leopard, and remember, as a spearman, he'd never really trained with the sword. He paused, remembering that day so long ago. You know, of course, that there is almost nothing that war gulls fear. They're called the unminded ones, and once they begin a battle, they almost always finish it. Almost always. This was one of the few times I saw war gulls afraid. As your father struck out to either side, still standing over his wounded comrade, 
They began to back away, slowly at first, then they ran. They simply turned and ran. I have never seen any other man, no knight, no mighty warrior, who could send war galls running in fear. Your father did. He may have been a sergeant, Will, but he was the mightiest warrior I ever had the privilege to watch. Then, as the war gods retreated, he sank down on one knee beside the man he'd been protecting, still trying to shield him, even though he knew he was dying himself. He had taken half a dozen wounds, but it was probably the first that killed him. And was his friend saved? Will asked in a small voice. Holt looked a little puzzled. His friend? he asked. The man he protected, Will explained. Did he survive? Somehow he thought it would have been a tragedy if his father's valiant attempt had been unsuccessful. They weren't friends, said Holt. Up until that moment, he'd never laid eyes on the other man. He paused, then added, Nor I on him. The significance of those last four words sank deep into Will's consciousness. You, he whispered, you were the man he saved? Holt nodded. As I said, I only knew him for a few minutes. But he did more for me than any other man before or since. As he was dying, he told me of his wife and how she was back at their farm alone with a baby due any day. He begged me to see that she was looked after. Will looked at the grim, bearded face he had grown to know so well. There was a deep sadness in Holt's eyes as he remembered that day. I was too late to save your mother. It was a difficult birth, and she died shortly after you were born. But I brought you back here, and Baron Arald agreed that you should be brought up in the ward, until you were old enough to become my apprentice. But all those years, you never... Will stopped, lost for words. Holt smiled grimly at him. I never let on that I'd placed you in the ward? No. Think about it, Will. People are... strange about rangers. How would they have reacted to you as you grew up? Wondering what sort of strange creature you were. We decided it would be better if nobody knew of my interest in you. Will nodded. Holt was right, of course. Life as a ward had been difficult enough. It would have been far more so if people had known he was somehow connected to Holt. "'So you took me as your apprentice because of my father,' said Will. "'But this time Holt shook his head. "'No, I made sure you were looked after because of your father. "'I chose you because you showed you had the abilities and the skills that were needed, "'and you also seemed to have inherited some of your father's courage.' "'There was a long, long silence between them "'as Will absorbed the story of his father's amazing battle. "'Somehow the truth was more stirring.' more inspiring than any fantasy he could have made up over the years to sustain himself. Eventually, Holt stood up to go, and he smiled gratefully up at the grizzled figure, now silhouetted against the sky as the last light of day died. "'I think my father would be glad I chose the way I did,' he said, slipping the bronze oak leaf on its chain over his head. Holt merely nodded once, then turned away and went inside the cottage, "'leaving his apprentice to his own thoughts. "'Will sat quietly for some minutes. "'Almost unthinkingly, "'his hand went to touch the bronze oak-leaf symbol "'hanging at his throat. "'Faintly, the evening breeze "'carried the sounds of the battle school drill-yard to him, "'and the non-stop hammering and clanking from the armoury "'that had been going on night and day for the past week. "'They were the sounds of Castle Redmond "'preparing for the coming war.' Yet strangely, for the first time in his life, he felt at peace. The End You've been listening to Ranger's Apprentice, Book One, The Ruins of Gorlin, by John Flanagan, narrated by John Keating and directed by Jeff Barron. This book is copyrighted 2005 by John Flanagan. This recording is copyrighted 2006 by Recorded Books. 
If you've enjoyed this book and this performance, Recorded Books recommends the next book in Ranger's Apprentice series, The Burning Bridge, also narrated by John Keating. For years, the kingdom of Araluen has prospered, with the evil lord safely behind the impassable mountains. But on a mission for the rangers, Will and his friend Horace travel to a neighboring village and discover the unsettling truth. All the villagers have been either slain or captured. But for what purpose? We also recommend The Book Without Words, a fable of medieval magic by Avi, narrated by John Curlis. The Book Without Words is a volume of blank parchment pages, or so it might seem. But for a green-eyed reader filled with great desire, it may reveal the dark magic of Northumbria, including the forgotten arts of making gold and achieving immortality. Set in early medieval England and rich with mystery and atmosphere, this is a thought-provoking fable about life and death, greed and betrayal, magic and secrets. You'll find a wide selection of titles in the Recorded Books catalog, including bestsellers, mysteries, classics, histories, and more. So to order another recorded book, or for a copy of our latest listing, please call the toll-free number found on the back of this book. Don't forget to ask about easy 30-day rentals by mail. On our website, you can browse our catalog, place orders, hear about our latest releases, or tune in to narrator profiles and author interviews. So visit us there at www.recordedbooks.com. And thank you for being a Recorded Books reader. Audible hopes you have enjoyed this program.